This is the third session of the oral history interview with Vera Maxwell, again in the living room of Miss Maxwell's home on March 5th, 1979. Miss Maxwell, do you give your permission for this portion of the interview as well to be included in the oral history project yes, at Fashion Institute? Yes, I do, John. Okay. I'd like to look generally at the period of 1940 and 1950, or the 1940s, I should say, in the 1950s, um, particularly in in three ways. Um, one, the sources of your design. Is there a limitation to those, or is it ongoing? Another area that I'd like to look at are the innovations with which you've been credited in design during the 40s and 50s. Uh, and of course, the, the third one would be the basis of it all, and that is the materials with which you've worked and for which you've become known. I know that in that latter area, one critic has said of you that you were born with a tweed spoon in your mouth. That's amusing. <laughs> rather, rather uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> rather, it would be silver. Yeah. <laughs> However, I think uh, I think the point is well taken. You have been known for your use of fabrics in design. Uh, as I said, you've been credited with many innovations in design, and of course, everyone has sources for the design. So, let's first of all, if we can look at the beginning of your love for tweed, which I think goes back to the 30s, doesn't it? Oh, yes, I went abroad. As I said, I think earlier, that uh, one of the people I worked for uh, had a buying agent, which I couldn't stand to have a buying agent. Let me close that. Uh, I went out on my own because I found out that I, a buying agent would send you to houses that you loathes what they were showing you, and you realize that, uh, you know, there's a little venality in almost everyone, and possibly you don't blame them, but they did send me to places that I knew they were, wanted me to buy from, and had, I had no interest in them. First, they'd be very expensive, and I went around to Balka's, a very famous uh, apartment store that had a wholesale department attached to it, and it's way up on... Knightsbridge, or other or Kensington High Street. And I wandered about there just for my own amusement and saw these magnificent tweeds. And I uh, took a chance and bought, I don't know, it seemed exorbitant to me, about $4,000 of the tweed on my own. And uh, I was soundly, um, you know, chastised for spending that, the firm's money until they sold it all and could never they sold every inch of it and tried to get some more, and of course the price was much more expensive. Then of course I went to Scotland, and it was a wonderful place. I adore Scotland in itself. Edinburgh is a beautiful city, still one of my favorite cities. But there's a little town called Haddington, Hidden Tomb it was called years ago in the time of James I. And uh, I loved that. I liked history enough to love being able to work in a place like that. And I would work with the mills there, and uh, I'd find out, once I remember designing a tweed, they had a, an enormous amount of, a very nice shade of moss green. And I said, oh, that was a terrible mistake. Somebody ordered it and we made the wrong shade. And they had, there's a difference in dyed in the wool, you know, and piece dyed. And this, this house, they've all dyed in the wool. And uh, I saw these bolts and bolts of, of well, spools of green. And he said, oh, he said, I wish I could use that up, but nobody seems to want green. And green isn't a very good color. So, so he had lots of other spools of every conceivable color. And one of the most beautiful tweeds I designed myself was to help him out because I liked him so much. And we laid out right there what we called it. Now, I had a garden in, in Bucks County at the time, and I always loved my dahlia garden. And dahlias have every color in the rainbow. And you look at it, but they've got a lot of green leaves around them. And I suddenly thought, how marvelous to have all that green with all those colors. They had lavender, pink, yellow, gold. And I used up every bit of old uh, yarn they had in the place. And they made me 50 yards. But they had the green enough 
for a lot more pieces, and they didn't mind dyeing the other colors. It was one of the most successful tweeds I designed. And that's where we'd go about. This was uh, going, this is going back to the time this is of going Adler back. Adler. Uh, uh, no, this is further along than that. This is probably Max Milstein Max or Rouse and Jacobson. And uh, then I always went back, and they, they did another wonderful thing uh, there. And it was also, I love working with people that you don't like using their green up. It, would, it gave mm -hmm. me a lot of pleasure. You know, they were darling people. And they just blessed me for using up all that beautiful and beautiful yarns. And another time I went, and then they finally got into some peace dyes, but they were very small. And they had four different kinds of yarn. One was a mohair, one was a lamb's wool, and one was a, a, a very tight worsted. And they wove it into a pattern and then dyed it. And believe it or not, it came out in four different shades of one color. And it was a peace dye that everybody thought was yarn dye because all the colors were different. Because every uh, one was camel hair, I think. It was, it was a neutral camel's hair. But the four yarns woven into this sort of plaid made, I still have some of these swatches that uh, and when you dyed it, that was the one I got a front of windows mm. for that at Lord and Taylor's Taylor, right. because that was a it was a prize tweed in England or in, in Scotland, and um, I loved using that. And I went to Liberties of London and found, unfortunately, Lord and Taylor didn't follow through with it. My other small specialty shops did, but Lord and Taylor wanted little plain buttons to match. But I had with great difficulty before I'd gone up to Scotland had found some matrix buttons, they are turquoise cut in little bits and they make them in India. And I got them for something like uh, a dollar a dozen or something like that. And of course, uh, I knew Sir Arthur Liberty, by the way, he was a great friend and very, very nice. And they had a wholesale department. And I found um, a cinnabar button. These are incredible. You couldn't get them now, they'd be antiques. Beautiful little cin cinnabar button carved, set in brass. Hmm. And I got uh, um, amber, beautiful piece of amber, and they made a button for me out of it. So I took those three colors up to my friend, Mr. Adam Patterson, Mr. Blake of Adam Patterson, and they dyed these colors as the lapis lazuli, oh, and a lapis lazuli. I had four colors. Pieces of lapis lazuli that are, you can't even find today, small pieces, but mm -hmm. big enough for a button. But I love it best the, uh, the matrix button and the um, cinnabar. Cinnabar was an old button. And I was so proud to have found those buttons. And Dorothy shared it. Was one time she disappointed me. She said, oh, I don't like those buttons on there. I said, but they're semi-precious stones. I said, that's you know the whole light motif of my collection. She said, no, just dye those little four-hole buttons. I like them better. But fortunately, uh, the rest of the country bought, because I had dozens of buttons I had to buy to, to get them. Yeah. You know, I had to buy uh, uh, 144, 12 dozen of each, but I got rid of them all, except at Lord and Taylor. But you have to work from that angle. You know, I saw the buttons and I remembered the tweed. And we used the first, we used the tweed plain at one time and in its natural state, and the colors were all different. And when I went back uh, the following season, mm -hmm. uh, I, gave, I bought the buttons at Liberty's. Liberty's was a great place. That's where I discovered the uh, wild silk. The people using for curtains, they didn't use it for clothes at that time. I thought it was a beautiful fabric. But I think you have to lay a foundation, a fabric, before you even go on with whatever you're working on. You know, you, you have a piece of fabric in your hand and it lends itself to, to designing something. Worsteds I did in those days. Men's wear worsteds were, uh, I'd go down to the, the um, places where they sold, you know, their old production uh, down on, I think it was down on Duane Street at that time. It's probably moved. But I'd go down there at these odd lot houses, whatever they were called. and. The menswear patterns that didn't sell, the menswear department, would all be down there. They would, I remember finding a beautiful sort of topi brown with a, a white stripe in a heavenly 
men's wear very, very fine worsted. You hardly find it today. And the stripe, I guess, was a little too wide for most men's clothes. And I bought that, and I bought black and white. Men, then you never find navy and white down there because that was always used up by the men. The men's wear houses. But I'd find these odd fabrics. And one of the most successful suits, it was, I guess, one of them that won me the, the uh, early uh, Cody Award was my button back um, suit made of this stripe. And uh, it had a three quarter colorless coat and a charming little coat with an ecclesiastic collar. That was another one of my loves. I love the way a, a priest in a suit town looks. I would watch him coming up the aisle when I was a child, even then, and watch. There again, you know, from the point of view of designing, perception is the only thing you've got. I mean, a good memory and perception, because if you don't have it, forget it. I mean, it's one of those things you can't learn. You can't learn how to perceive you know, what you get out of something. Why that soutin? I, I just loved the way he looked, especially when he walked down the aisle, and I'd see the back of the soutin with that double pleat and a button, and it never was fitted. Even in those days, I liked the idea of something flowing on your body, never tight-fitting. My first designs were all just skimming the body, never really uh, you know, fitting it to so, the body. So you, you then touch on another point, and that is the source of your designs, and, and um, one of them evidently being the, the clerical. The, well, did you ever, you know, another, I did a whole collection uh, on uh, the eminent Victorians, and it's as long ago as Lytton Strachey's uh, book, and it was, there were pictures in it, and I remember Arnold, who was, uh, Dr. Arnold, who was the head of rugby, and uh, it's the first time I'd seen that kind of a color in a beautiful picture with a white color with two white tabs. It's very ecclesiastic and very good looking. And I put that on my black and white and my brown and beige uh, suit. And it was very, it's just that little white touch that you needed with the two little tabs. Mm -hmm. I did uh, Chinese Gordon in a, with braid, you know, I did a very good looking uh, jacket and he had a little cape on, it was very good looking. And Florence Nightingale in her flowing dress, it was lots of fun doing that, but I just got uh, interested in that, and I did. I still have an ad from Lord and Taylor's of the eminent Victorians, which I like. That Alida and Wessex thought was charming. I can't think who the other one was. I can remember Nor Florence Nightingale, Arnold, and uh, Chinese Gordon. Mm -hmm. but I guess I come from a very literary family, so I, I think I'm always going back to, you know, but my brother's great. Joy is Huckleberry Finn or Mark Twain, and I did a whole collection on Mark Twain, I think. And I did another collection much later. Uh, he's a medievalist, so I used to read the Canterbury Tales and fascinated, and I named everything, you know, the lady from Bath and the, the baker's wife, and I had clothes that were uh, equal to the characters, in, and there are many characters in Canterbury Tales. And there was sort of medieval, which I, there was a period when um, that medieval look came in, it was very classic and, mm -hmm. and flowing, and, which I adored. I had some beautiful brown, or I'd been to Denmark by that time, and I saw the oldest dress extant in the world. They, they dug it out of a, a crypt somewhere, and there's not much left of it, but just enough to put it that the Danes, at that Danish museum, I'll never forget, and they lifted this, what was left, but it was on the bones of the woman. She was, it was in a place that stayed fairly, I think it was 620 Good AD. Lord. And it is, according to Miss Beers of, of um, or Mrs. Beers of the museum, uh, what is the name of that? The, the Smithsonian, Smithsonian in New York, but it's not, uh, what is it called? I'll think of it in a minute, but it's a marvelous museum for, it's mostly for, for it has many costumes, but the, Miss Beers is 84 years old and knows more about fabrics than anybody in the world, I'm sure. Anybody, if she's, she can't see many people, but her treaties on fabrics are worth getting a hold of. She really was incredible. And when I told her about this, she was the one that said, no, that's the oldest um, piece of fabric, you know, that's in the form of a dress. 
and a, a costume. I think they have shreds of material that are old, you know, earlier yeah. than that. But for fabric and and that where they what they did, where the dress had rotted away or the fabric had rotted away, they could see the lines of the dress, and they took a piece of muslin, but it was a, a shiny muslin which was good, and put this uh, sort of hand woven. It was a beautiful shade of nut brown that must have been dyed with, you know, nut coloring or something, mm. and or tan bark or something. And they took that and very, very carefully embroidered it on this very shiny bit of thing so that you saw the shape of the dress. And she was loaded with beautiful gold amulets and chains, and they found all those. But I have never in my life been in a muse you, any museum that struck me. I wrote my son about it, or everybody, about that that museum. From that, to go into with the fishermen's, because every place I looked, I've seen, again, we're talking of Michelle Murphy at the Brooklyn Museum, uh, loved folk clothes and people's, just people who wear clothes, not the kings and queens and the empresses and that you see ad nauseum in collections all over the world or in portraits. But here you see the fishermen, what they actually wore, the beautiful embroidered oilskins. And they had a whole uh, series of um, rooms filled with different sections, up to the Laplanders with embroidered furs, you know, or stenciled furs. Very Chinese looking embroidered, uh, uh, copying Chinese embroideries and stencil. And I often wonder which came first, the stenciling that the Chinese copied, mm -hmm. because they're both ancient peoples, or whether the Chinese did it first and the Laplanders copied it. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting uh, theory. But that dress, I think I will never forget that medieval dress. I did this, this, when I came back, I was so enamored of that, I did this medieval collection and took my brother's uh, medieval Chaucer. He's written six books on Chaucer, I think, and I took the simplest one and read it. And it was very interesting. There were many, many characters in it, and it was fun to do. I didn't get any publicity on that because nobody picked that up, strangely enough, you know, as a, mm -hmm. as a theme. It was a very good theme, and I enjoyed it very much because the clothes were right up my alley. It's just a, you know, a loose, simple sleeve and a simple, uncluttered neckline, but very uncluttered. The capes were uncluttered with beautiful, put on with a beautiful fibula or something, beautiful hair ornaments, comb, not comb so much as pins and things mm -hmm. that they wore in their hair. It's a wonderful museum that uh, they call it the Musique. <laughs> but uh, it's a charming place to go. But you get ideas. I've gotten ideas in Spain with those marvelous uh, um, guards. First, when you alight at the airport, they're always standing guard with their flat hats, you know, patent leather hats, and those wonderful costumes and the way they walk. I mean, you just get a whole feeling of of. Um, and I had a hat design and more. When I did a hat, I usually had it all through the collection. If it, it had to be a good enough one to wear with almost anything. I, very, I didn't do many hats, but when I saw one like that, I would do it. But you, you know, you can get an idea from a child and its mother, uh, the way she catches up a child's petticoat or something. And uh, this, you know, as I say, it's all perception. It's what you see. And I saw Arab boys. That, Dirty, dirty pink colors that I was fascinated because you knew they were bright red at one time, and only the sun could dye at that color, and you can't re-dye at that color. But you knew that that's that's how that beautiful color came about. It was not lavender. It wasn't faded pink. It was red that had faded into an incredible color. Mm. And uh, I did a Moroccan collection. Once and, and that's where I did the Jalaba for the first time. I know it was done again about two or three years ago. Some young, I don't know, it was Bill Blass or something, had been in Morocco and came back. And I said he evidently didn't remember, he was too young to remember my Moroccan collection because I was there in '51 and came back with the, the Moroccan colors and the Jalaba with the Jalaba cloth, which he didn't have the thing. I described that before that wonderful right. Jalaba cloth where the women weave it themselves. And only old men sell in the in the little soups. You never see a woman around, and you never see a man between 24 and 40 or 50, because they're old at 50 very very often. Men, 
But you see, the grandfathers and a, up to about a 12-year-old son, even a 14-year-old boy wouldn't deign to, to sit all day in a shop. It's all the old people. The wives are all, as I said, wandering around the countryside or at home, weaving or mm -hmm. cooking or sewing. They have wonderful shirts over there that are, they're very loose. Now we use them all the time, but when I brought those back, I loved them with a drapey shoulder. And, and uh, the same thing that uh, Claire Potter saw in the gaucho shirt with the loose big sleeves, which is rather nice, and the little neckband collars. But I loved the, they'd use all bits and pieces of embroidery and make little designs. Men, all the women's, uh, the women wear dresses more than shirts. But I think one amusing thing in Morocco was seeing these beautiful navy blue um, uh, jalabas that the, that the 24 to 50 year old men wore. The old men wore the very rough jalabas and the little boys. But when they went out, uh, you know, into being gentle. A lot of them didn't work, you know. And if they worked, they worked as little as they could, I imagine. But the handsomest men I think I've ever seen, some of those Arabs, the dark-eyed Arabs, and their beautiful walks. And I watched them, and they'd have these magnificent jalabas of navy blue, little black bindings. And I asked my friend, uh, Mrs. McVeigh, and when she said, they're Forsman's. <laughs> see Gabardine, see one Gabardine. And I thought, that was marvelous. I was dying to get a piece of it, you know. And she said, oh, that's Forsman's. They love Forsman's. One of the, you're chic if you wear a, if you wear a homespun navy blue, you're not in it. You have to wear a Forsman's. And the other one that I thought was even funnier, it's like our ladies wearing Gucci shoes. They would walk. Instead of having a white hake, you know, those things that you know, uh, women wear to cover their face, to cover their, everything but their eyes show. Uh, I mean, uh, it's covered. And they used to just wear these dirty white pieces of wool or cotton or something, and they were filthy always because they really wiped their noses on them and wiped their mouths and their children's faces. And I've never seen them that they aren't walking around pretty dirty. And uh, then I noticed they were striped, and I looked at them very closely, and as they held up the side, it was always cannon written on the side, so the cannon tower was their Gucci, <laughs> their symbol of, of what the ladies yeah. today, and I think the ladies with their Gucci shoes were silly, you know, but they paid twice as much. And that was their uh, distinction, to have a cannon towel, but they showed it, everyone wore it, showed the, the label so that everybody could see it. I loved those. That's 1951. I don't know what they're using now. It's amusing. But I don't think you can go anywhere without, if you have perception, without getting an idea of something. It's a, it's a, because the more you do, the more ideas you get, too. I mean, the more you work on on, a, on an idea, the, you know, you, you think, I'm sure that writers feel the same way. You know, I don't think you... There are some writers who have a one... There are some designers who have a one, one dress design. Just like a good writer can have one book, she can be an incredible designer, but she'll only have one dress or one or two dresses to her credit. But I'm much too gregarious for that. And the, the ideas come so fast and furiously. You know, at the end of a season, I'm just beginning at the end of a, a line that I'm doing, or a collection I'm doing, my best things come. You know, you're just really creating and unfortunately, you have to stop. Very often, you can carry them over to the next season if they're that good. Sometimes they aren't that good and they disappear. But uh, very often, just you're just dying to make a few more things, and it's too late. You have to close the, your workroom at some time or another and get the line on the road. That's amusing to see. But I think the young girls that come in to me with numerous sketches, they think designing is nothing except putting a sketch on the paper. And they haven't any idea what they're going to do with it, or whether even they don't even think about the fabric. They're just making a lot of paper dolls. As far as I, you can get a Vogue Harper, you can get thousands of magazines to see the same things that they've put on paper. You don't need that. What you need is the construction. I, the reason I sent the fabric down to my idea was to have the girls, uh, and they, I think they did that. They were each given a some yardage of the fabric. This is my idea of designing. You give them a hunk of fabric, 
do something with it. And whichever girl or man or designer does the best thing with that fabric, even if it's just cutting it up. My idea was in front of me to, to give it all to them and have them sit there and cutting up the thing and putting it on a figure and seeing what they did with it, you know. Even pinned up lightly if it's a, if it's a tailored thing. You, know, mm -hmm. you can pin up enough, see, see what their idea is in the fabric. But I think that's the only kind of designing, to take your fabric and stop manipulating it and get a creative idea out of the fabric. So for the most part, then, your, your designs have come from a fabric yeah, or, both, both yeah, ways, or a, you know, a, I'll see the medieval thing right. and, and put it, I had, I had a specially woven uh, sort of Lindsay Woolsey done for this thing I saw in Denmark. And I got, a, in those days, it was easy to get a, an American house. There are a few good small shops, uh, uh, good American uh, um, mills, especially in New England, that were hard pressed to find work. And I would find them, and uh, they do yardage for me. Not by the, I never did 100,000 yards or 10,000 yards at a clip. I had like 500 yards, you know, to play around with, and it was hard to find those people. To um, today, I have to do all sorts of things to get original fabrics because they either want to make you up, they will, but you have to promote it from here to Timbuktu and. <clears throat> as I, as whoever did the the loading cloth, when I I brought it over, I just bought 500 yards to try it out, and several buyers bought it. But then when somebody brought it over and promoted it, and it was Anglo did the it was Anglo Fabrics that did the um, loading cloth with Idlewife in the buttonhole and promoted it, which to me is ghastly. I mean, it should, the imitation Idlewife in the buttonhole. <laughs> and it just bothers me, that kind of over-promotion. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, to pick up, if we can, for a moment, uh, this idea of the sources of your design as well as, um, not as well as, but and, the, the materials, the, the fabrics with which you've worked, and talk a little bit about some of the designs with which you've been credited during that period of the 40s and the 50s. And I guess maybe if we could go through these one by one and, and sort of if you could try to recall for us the source of the design or how it came to be. Uh, historically, of course, that would be very important for us. And I guess maybe the earliest one, well, we talked about the Einstein jacket, which was back in the mid-30s yeah. when you did that. That was in uh, Donny Gall. Black and white Donegal Tweed. Right. And that came as a result of seeing Einstein in Princeton. Yes, that right? was my brother was teaching at, at uh, Princeton. It was funny, I was looking all there was only one that was in a beautiful book and I was tempted to buy it. But usually he wore a sweater, I've noticed, and most uh, he we have a what is it, a centennial or something of, of Einstein today, because you see him in all the magazines. Right. And every time he's got that I have a picture of him in that sweater. Um in my collection, but I also have one very faded picture of his the jacket with the little collar, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, and the black tie, the low cut black tie that he wore. But in all the pictures I've seen, I haven't seen him in that jacket, which is very, very funny, you know. He, he, and he wore it all the time in Princeton. Oh. Right? Not all the time, I didn't see him that often, but a few times I saw him coming out of his little house, which was quite near my brother's who lived there. Uh, that's why I saw him. And I only met him at a large party or something, not a party even, but some conference or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, hardly said hello to him. He was such a great character, you know. And, and, uh, but it was fun to see him just walking along the street, you know, and going to one of his classes or whatever. I visited my brother. I was living in Pennsylvania at the time, so I was there a lot. But. Um, I guess Einstein was early. Uh, and then the fencing dress, I guess. Would the be fencing the was the one I, the, the inspiration for that was this wonderful worsted I found, you know, menswear worsted, mm -hmm. because I loved the idea of menswear worsted for a hang. And then I did it in black broadcloth, and uh, Bergdorf featured it in black broadcloth, as did Gordon Taylor's. And then I did a a uh, fencing dress, which is a dress buttoned all the way down the back like a pinafore, but very 
handsome. I mean, it was very well tailored with black broadcloth with satin cuffs and with a satin binding at the neck, you know, and flat satin buttons in the back. Mm -hmm. Always with pockets, you know. And uh, why would you say always with pockets? Well, I, I don't know. I just think that that men always are comfortable with pockets. I used to see my handsome brother-in-law, and he had English, and he was, you know, great savoir faire. But I noticed most Englishmen always had pants with big pockets, you know, or jackets with pockets. And they always looked so somehow comfortable and with it and, and very much themselves. And from that time on, I put pockets in everything because I think, what does an actress learn first? What to do with her hands? And I think women are terribly self-conscious as a rule. I get terribly annoyed when I go across the country and find out how insecure most women are about their clothes. I felt that they had pockets. I made pocket dresses as early as I can remember. I made a feature of patch pockets, with embroidered patch pockets, and you know, braid trim patch pockets, or a beautiful piece of Persian fabric I found somewhere that was priceless, and I only had 100 yards of it, but it was enough to cut up in pieces mm -hmm. on, a, on a dress. And, uh, but very obvious, you know, the patch pocket dress, I was very, well, that's later on that, that I, did the patch pocket dress around the 50s, I guess. It was very, very well known by most of my customers. And the women loved it because, you know, it was a place to leave your handkerchief or anywhere or uh, whatever you were, a piece of paper or somebody give you a, a card or their address <laughs> or something, you could tuck it away. But I, I've always liked pockets and I think it makes sense. Today we use them all the time, but yeah. it, the dresses didn't have pockets in it then. They liked that terribly smooth look, which I didn't like, that terribly fitted look. So a pocket somehow didn't fit on the dress, or it was smooth, it would spoil the smooth line over your hips or something. Well, I never liked that. I think the dresses should be more flowing. And there the uh, peasant look came in with the shirt dresses where you could put pockets in the side seams, you know, and hide your hands. And wipe your hands on the, on the print would be so... You know, if you wore it around the kitchen or something like that, you didn't need an apron. I right. mean, those little calicos I used to use. We called them the farmer's market, those dresses. And very often, uh, or even today, I'm re reviving the dress with a lined coat, which was one of my light motifs from 40, 50, and 60. 60s, they died out of it. I didn't sell many at all in the 60s. I didn't sell many much of anything in the 60s almost lost my business. I hung on like, like a... We're going to get to that in, in but, just a few moments. Uh, the wrap blouse came, I think, because I was... Uh, I saw some very, very cheap dresses that I didn't like made of Arnell jersey. And it was a marvelous fabric. I recognized it as a very, very good fabric. And it's, the reason it was so awful in, you know, learners or the cheaper shops. You never saw it in a good shop. A, a, a good designer wouldn't have used Arnell jersey as being, oh, you know, you want to use silk jersey. Or, and, uh, but it washed. It was the first washable. And later on, I found out that it was pleatable. And they, they, you could, they could make it, and they put some kind of a finish on it that was permanently pleated. And I thought, that's an incredible new uh, innovation. A woman can have a pleated dress. I adored pleats, as I've often said. But they had to be very full pleats. And the dresses I saw were tiny little pleats that were not a half inch in inlay. And it was a yard and a half of pleats on the dress. And I took the Arnell jersey and put five yards of permanent pleating in the skirt, shirt on a waistband, and did a wrapped uh, jersey blouse. It was really, I must have sold that to the cows came home. I mean, I, that was one of the first big sellers, I think, when I was, especially, that was one of the first things I did in business for myself. Mm -hmm. And it was the discovery of the Arnell, which lay then the Dacron. I did striped Dacrons in the same mood of uh, a one piece dress and a beautiful fabric I found, a menswear again that wasn't used too much. It was a bad shade, I guess sort of a pale taupe, and I had a, a woven striped uh, Dacron that was incredible, and a polka dot. I was one of the first to, to take a piece of Dacron and print it myself, 
and I printed it in a blue and white dot. And uh, I have a very good ad from DuPont. They didn't want to show it because, again, I was doing a charming little shirt dress with a lined coat and a polka dot. And I had a, a red carnation and a navy blue coat. And they wouldn't take a picture of the coat. They said, no, we want to show the dress. And I said, no, I don't want to show the dress alone because I very rarely sold separate dresses at the time. So I finally, they liked the dress so much, but they showed it open. It was all right. You saw almost the whole dress. And I said, well, look, at you're using much more lining. Look at the lining I'm using. You know, the whole coat is lined with your fabric. And it's a very good looking sketch. I mean, a photograph mm -hmm. of the whole navy blue coat with a little roll back sleeves and a simple little shirt dress with a bow tie at the neck. And it's a very pretty ad. It's one of my nicest. And that came about. Of, but nobody had printed, uh, at that time, nobody had printed the uh, um, jerseys of that mm -hmm. kind. You mentioned the uh, turn back sleeves. That's always been a thing with you, hasn't it? Yeah, I. you know why? I think I, I had to wear my older sister's clothes, and yeah. I always had a you know, dress a little sleeve was too long or a coat uh -huh. was sleeve. Despite my mother trying to shorten it, it always seemed big. So especially the sleeve, I was terribly conscious of the sleeves. And I think the, almost the first thing I designed was turn back cuff. And later on, I had a technique that I found out from my architect husband. He called it an architect cuff. All architects with five or six buttons on the side, very elegant. And the the, um, the fabric went right straight back five or six inches into the... So when you turned it back, you didn't see the lining fabric as you turned it back. Mm -hmm. I used to turn it back three inches and put a three inch, and then later on I'd put five or six inches so you could turn it way back and make almost a three-quarter sleeve out of it. And that, that coat, I think, that I made the, the turn back cuff on, you could, if you were very conservative and didn't and liked long sleeves, you'd still have a long sleeve coat if you turned it down. Mm -hmm. but when you turned it back, and I found when I'd go out looking at women in trying a coat on, they'd look rather apey with long sleeves and, and, and old. I realized when I try a coat on one, the minute she turned her sleeve back, there was a youthful look, look about the coat. It gave her a, a much more youthful appearance than a long sleeve. And uh, that coat I did with the little tiny shoe buttons down the front. It was a famous coat. That was copied more than any coat I think I've ever had. Uh, Carmel was, I think, gave me the nicest compliment. I was in uh, Paris one year, and we were both at the Ritz, and George Carmel was sitting in the lobby, and I came through, and he said, hello, Miss Maxwell. And I said, well, hello, George. And I said, you can call me Vera. And he said, well, I want to tell you, you gave us our best season with that coat of yours we copied. And I thought that was very sweet of him. <laughs> you know. You got, and, yeah. At least some credit came from someplace, right? Now, there was another big coat house that copied almost every coat I ever designed, they copied right away, and they were cheaper than I was. And then they ended up by being more expensive than mine. <laughs> no, their, their coats became more expensive uh -huh. than mine. They were famous for their camel fair coats. Speaking of coats, the Chesterfield coat has also been credited to Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a perennially, I still make Chesterfield coats. I think it's a very, that's again not terribly fitted, you know it. Mm. Chesterfield goat coat, sort of. Um, it's a slight flare. It's like it isn't even a flare. It just just comes almost close to the body. It's about an inch and a half on either side of your body, and then it flares a little bit over the hips. Mm. It's just to really just to have as slim a coat as you can get without having it uh, flared or fitted. Mm -hmm. And uh, it always is successful. I've 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 been making that coat for goodness knows how many years and different ways, you know, I make it collarless, with a buttoned up the neck with the little buttons, I've made it double breasted, I've made it classically as an officer's coat with a big wide lapel. But in ultra suede it's selling very, very well. Still, yes. with a big that, pleat in the back, you know. That I don't even put a pleat, I like a slit in the back of my coats. I started that too because I I like to work with tailoring and I found out I'm sorry to say that the tailor is getting worse as we pay them more money, which everybody knows. It's not news by any means. 
but they were meticulous when I first went into the business, and they could do a beautiful pleat or an inlay in a coat with a fine little uh, L shape, you know, at the top of the of the coat, beautifully tailored, so that little L was meticulously done. Later on, I'd see that when, you know, the L would drag and the coat would split at the bottom, and it wouldn't be true, and it would drive me up the wall. So I decided to, to when I, especially when I'm in business with myself, I used to slit them. I was, I think I still have a coat from the 49 with the same body, just slurping the body, you know, it just barely touches the body in camel's hair, long, with a great enormous slit to the waistline in the back. And I felt that if a woman is sitting in a car or something, she could pull the coat over her. And the fall of the coat is so much better when you just slit it up the back. But it was innovation, and a lot of buyers at first would look at it, and gradually they got it, because I, if I was out in the showroom to explain it to them, they'd buy it. But sometimes the salesman wouldn't have the reason why I was doing it. And I'd show them a coat that would be ex more expensive than that, with this little um, L-shaped um, cut in the coat, and how badly. It had to be done by hand, and, you know, it had to be stitched in the back by hand. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the coat was more expensive, and I said half the time, uh, it isn't. You don't cut them up as far either. You know, you used to cut it about 15 inches from the base of the coat. <coughs> that camel's hair was the first time I used uh, wool, a wool dress and a wool coat. I think the reason for that is I was in Neiman Marcus once, and I went to a, a big party they gave at the Brooks Club. And I really was disgusted with it, you know, very, very extravagant guest, overdressed women. I was a, you know, game. I don't know how many English duchesses I've heard say, you know, she's too overdressed, it's always safer to be underdressed and she doesn't know it. And it's such a good maxim. And when I got to uh, Dallas, the Brooks Club, which is a very, very exclusive club, and every woman arrived with what I call a Margaret Mitchell hairdo, you know, piled high on her head, little white mink or pastel mink jackets, short, strapless evening dresses with all the jewels they could find on, and then the tulle and jet and uh, sequins, and everything they could find on a dress. And it was so overdressed, it was painful. I mean, there were uh, only one or two, I think Billy, uh, uh, Marcus, Neiman Marcus's wife, who was a beautifully dressed woman, was elegantly dressed, you know, very simple and elegantly dressed. And maybe another one of the Neiman Marcus wives, because they were really perfection, they were really well dressed women. The average woman was overdressed, too many jewels, too much hairdo, and those ghastly little mink jackets, they all had them on, capes or jackets, of all mutation mink or, you know, white mink. And I went back, this is a country club out in the deep country, you know, and I said, what are they doing looking like that? And I went home and I thought I was doing it to Stanley Marcus. I thought he would be delighted and I had a whole collection of four or five. I have one in the closet here that I wear myself, of a gray John Bar Tweed and a, a sort of brocaded silk, gray and beige brocaded silk dress underneath, very good looking, the lining of the colors that you made of the dress. This one I did in, in camel's hair. I love, I kept it because I loved it so much. I didn't keep it for myself. It was, didn't fit me. It was too, not, you know, tall enough for it. But it was a camel's hair coat, collarless, slightly high-waisted with a, just a tie. It looked again like a vest, slipped right up the back and tied like a bathrobe, you know, just folded over and tied very, very casually. And it was faced not double-faced with a heavy worsted or a heavy camel's hair. It was faced with black watch, a very fine black watch worsted. Very, very lightweight one, sort of a shally weight worsted. Mm. And I did a little armpit dress, a boat neck, very simple sleeves, and put some beautiful uh, Celtic jewelry on with it. It was charming. And I loved showing it in the showroom and uh, little navy suede slippers. But Stanley said, oh no, our ladies like French clothes. Well, I never got anywhere with it. Twenty years later, they were wearing the, the tweed mm -hmm. uh, evening things, or much more understated evening things. It was about 20 years for them to 
to turn into that. And I thought Stanley would certainly, or any one of the Marcuses would know what I would be doing in showing four or five wool evening things with wool evening dresses. This is chilly, too, you know, in those places. Very often I'd have little sleeveless ones, you know, but uh, I, I still love doing tweed evening clothes or jerseys. I love jersey dresses for evening. You mentioned uh, Stanley Marcus, and indeed, during the 50s, in addition to the your special Cody Award in 1951 and 1955, you were the recipient of the Neiman Marcus Fashion Award uh, well, for your design. That was because I, I, I spent some time in Florence and Venice. And in Florence, and uh, there was a, a branch of this shop. I shouldn't know the name. I should know the name. Maybe I will, as a footnote, give you the name because it's very important. That silk house, they made hand-woven silks in Florence. And they were there since the time of Dante. And they're, 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 I even have a, I think I still have a label, but their label and their booklet that they sent out had a picture of Dante on it. But they made hand-woven fabrics for the Medicis. And uh, I found this place. I have some very good friends in Florence, the Bellinis. And of the Bellini family, you know. Anyway, I fell in love with the silk. And it's incredible. I see terrible looking silks at $35 a yard. These were $25 a yard. And I bought, oh, some beautiful brocades. And I have some pillows. There's one right over there, with a pillow on it, made of it. And I made theater coats of brocade with little fur collars, and I had this one, I still have a little bit of the fabric. It was a beautiful fabric with a little fleur-de-lis, which is the, the emblem of Florence later on in France, but it's really a Florentine uh, pattern. And it was beige with real gold leaf, embroidered, not embroidered, but woven mm -hmm. in a little fleur-de-lis pattern. And I put a sable collar on that. And I think it was those two things that Neiman Marcus gave me the award on. But it was also the, in addition to acknowledging you for your design, they also provided you with an opportunity for the rest of your life, which was the fact that... Oh, I met Grace in Monaco, yeah. Grace of Monaco. She was then Grace Kelly, and one of the leading actresses of our time, movie actresses. What a wonderful... Even then, I sense we have, we're ages apart. I'm old enough to be her mother. And she... I looked across the dance floor, and or across the dinner table when we were sitting uh, at one of these big uh, parties, and numerous young men would come over, and there were about four, there were about four other starlets from Hollywood there, and uh, although she was getting the prize for the best dressed woman in Hollywood, the others shouldn't have gotten it with their <laughs> ghastly looking clothes and hairdos. They were all made up to the nines, you know, very sexy looking. And but still, she attracted Grace. Attracted some of the cowboys and some of the young Neiman Marcus sons who were just going, and the younger brothers. But I loved the other girls. Had this ghastly saccharine. The whole evening, they'd have this great porcelain smile on, you know, teeth shining, and 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 it was the, the smile was a fixture on their face. You know, it never left. And I was absolutely, you know transported by watching Grace. She had a beautiful look on her face. And when somebody would come over, she'd graciously say no and have a charming smile, but her face would go back to its natural look, you know. But she had such savoir faire at 23 and a half or 24, or 23 and a half. I said, this child is remarkable. I said, with her, the the fanfare that's been done about her, you know, and she was in every magazine and everybody was talking about her beauty. I still think she's the present day Helen of Troy. I've never met anybody that could come up to her grace and beauty. You know, grace is not the right word, but she is a very gracious and a graceful gal. But we were thrown together a lot because she wanted to, to um, leave early on some, we were there for about four days. And uh, I remember uh, we shared a large living room and we had two bedrooms, a big suite. And I guess several, Sally Kirkland and somebody else, and Nancy White, I think, had a suite. And fortunately for me, Grace and I had a 
the suite, with a big living room in between, she came up to me and she said, D would you like to leave now or would, I would you just walk upstairs with me? Because I hate to leave alone and it seems as though, you know, I'd be helping you up, you know, or, you know, going up with you. And I said, I'd be delighted. I can't stand this place another minute. <laughs> and uh, so we went up and we'd have a glass of milk and sit down. And the reason we became such good friends is because I carry with me a little, uh, I have a tiny little edition of Shakespeare. And it, it, only I'm not that much of a Shakespeare fan, except that I do like his sonnets. But I, they're tiny little uh, Morocco-bound books, and I used to pick one up when I left anywhere and slip it in a bag to read on a plane or something. And I happened to put Shakespeare's sonnets in my bag. And they were on uh, my bedroom table, I suppose, and she came in, I don't know whether I was undressing or what, and uh, she said, oh, you like Shakespeare's sonnets, and she knew about, a, I don't remember one, I've read it dozens of times, I can't remember one, but I have a terrible memory for that. She spouted line after line of Shakespeare, she's my favorite, one of my favorite things to read is Shakespeare's sonnets, of course we became very good friends, and I didn't know, she didn't confide in me that she had met, the reason she wanted to go upstairs and didn't want to be photographed too much is because she already had fallen in love with Renier. And nobody knew it, really, except her family. And she went back, and this is in October, and by December she had, she had her engagement party. And uh, the reason we became such good friends is that just by accident I had met her, and then I met her in New York once, and she was at uh, the night of her engagement, just in passing. We said hello to each other, and that was that. And... Uh, my son and I, I took my son abroad after he, just before he went in as a doctor, and he had one, you know, six months or six weeks, I guess it was. So I took him abroad to treat him, you know, to a trip before he turned into a very serious doctor. And uh, I got on, I just went to London. I didn't take, I just went to London with him, I think in Scotland. And uh, we got on the United States in Southampton. And... Uh, about the second night out, well, the first night out, I guess it was, the second night out, I had a little note on my desk saying, uh, Princess Grace and Prince Renier would like to ha come to their cabin for a cocktail uh, tomorrow evening or the sea or tonight or whenever. And uh, I called her and I said, I had my son with me. She said, oh, fine, you come. I'd love to meet him. So we both went and then we got to be, because they didn't want to mix up too much, and they wanted few people. There, Rupert, Hugh, Rupert Allen, her publicity man for MGM, was abroad, charming man, and uh, his financial advisor, Pierre Ray, was on, and uh, Pierre Ray was a very smart man, because I think he fell for me, and I didn't really like him when I first met him. I did not dislike him or like him. I mean, I didn't pay much attention to him. But from my, I gathered from Grace that uh, he liked me right away. And being a widower, a, a widower of a year and a half or two years, um, he was smart enough never to ask me right out. He made friends with my son, which I thought was a brilliant tactic, you know, a young, mm -hmm. he was not that young, but anyway, I thought he was, as I said once before, I think he was a great diplomat. I've never met anyone that could smooth waters the way he could. But uh, it was a delightful crossing because we had dinner every night together then. And I think in my, didn't I mention the story about seeing the cocktail parties in New York here? No. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, when they came here on that trip, Grace's, all Grace's friends gave him parties. Yes, I'm sorry, we did talk we about did that. We did talk about thinking, it. That's how, that's how Renier's friendship of mine became uh, also that he was delighted that his financial advisor had found a new interest in life. And uh, oh, I was invited to the palace for Christmas, and I went over Christmas. And then uh, I've met so many marvelous people through them, which I think I've mentioned before. You do have, you do have the... Um, one story about Winston Churchill that you told me off the tape, but no, I no, I put I told that on the tape. I think was it on the tape? Yeah. 
I'm sure. I'm sure I did. Okay. No, okay. No. We have no. so many hours now. No, I talked to about I talked about um, uh, <clears throat> Cary Grant and Frank Sinatra and uh, especially Nate, David Niven and That's how right. charming David Niven was. And they're really good friends, David Niven and Cary Grant. Is a charmer, mm. and a char charming daughter that I think I may have mentioned. But uh, I do know of the Churchill thing, which I was fortunate enough to meet. Great. Nothing is, is as exciting as meeting a man like Churchill, even at the end of his days. Oh, sure. I mean, to have a memory like that and uh, to. Uh, I let my grandchildren always, you know, being impressionable. And I said, I'd met Eisenhower. And I was counting, and then I. He said, How many presidents have you met, Grammy? <laughs> I said, Not many. I said, I met Roosevelt once. I met Churchill, I met uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower, and I met Truman abroad um, not long before he died with Pierre Ray. Pierre Ray was showing him around uh, uh, the Monte Carlo, uh, the SBM, which is the gambling resources and the hotels and this whole wonderful um, uh, conglomeration of, of Places and I remember Pierre Ray was showing Bess and Truman around, and I went along, so it was fun meeting them. What but was I've he met, like? What was your opinion of President Truman? Oh, marvelous! What a man! I wish we had him right now. Oh, oh what a man! And I only met him for a short time. But meeting Don Carlos, the young Spanish, uh, he is now the Spanish uh, king, that yeah. his mother and father. <clears throat> A very, you know, his father's rather done. His name is, uh, he's a Count of Barcelona, is his title. And uh, his, uh, his wife is called Maria. She's, she really should be Queen Maria and uh, her husband, the king. But he gave his son the title, I think. Or the, I think the Spanish people insisted on it, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. I don't think they met, like, uh, they have to live in Portugal. It was a very sad thing. Uh, last Christmas, I was visiting. No, it wasn't last Christmas. Just this year, with uh, Carolyn's wedding, in Monte Carlo, and uh, I've always thought of Maria, the Queen Maria, as being the most austere-looking woman. I've known her for about ten years, but I've only seen her at big dinner parties, and we were never thrown together in a smaller ambiance as I was with Churchill. Her husband's easy to get along with. He's often asked me to get up and dance from little places, and he's very gay and very charming. And But Maria always sits there. She looks like a Goya painting, mm. you know, of, of 1810 or something. I've never seen anything so austere and beautiful, but in a very, very aquiline fashion, you know, but as the French call racine, you know. And uh, this time, we were all together what, looking at Carolyn's presence that she'd gotten, and we were in a small, then we'd had a small dinner party. And I still was a little in awe of her, but we did get talking a little bit more than we ever had before. And it was just Renier and Grace and Carolyn and her. I don't think Carolyn was there. They'd been all fun. It was after their wedding we went. We were looking at the presents that they left behind. And uh, Maria and uh, uh, her husband, uh, Count of Barcelona, uh, we're standing there with maybe two or three other people, and Renier tried a new uh, hi-fi set that was given to Carolyn and Philip for a wedding present. And he got where he got the record from, there were a pile of records there. And he took a record from the top and put it on, and it happened to be a Charleston. And Maria suddenly started doing a Charleston. I almost, it was just charming. And we later that evening, oh, we talked a lot, and I, it's so strange that after all those years to find a very, very human and uh, charming woman, you know, and she was she and her husband, and we were all doing the Charleston in this very small space, you know, but it was such a, a charming um, reversal of what I thought she was. You know, it was my fault probably for being as, as diffident as she seemed to be. Mm -hmm. But what was very sad, the reason I really told the story is a sad thing. Later on, we went in. And uh, Don Carlos was just uh, visiting France with the um, president of France in Paris. 
And we were turning the news on. We went back after we'd seen the presents, and we were back to have cocktails or something in the town of news in Renier. We were very intimate because we were in this little television room. And uh, we were sitting there, and Renier turned the television on, and we were looking. And suddenly Don Carlos came on. And Maria looked, and she said, that's my son. And the, her eyes started to water, and I realized that she, he can come to Portugal once in a while, but she cannot go to France, you see. I mean, to Spain. Uh, Spain. And uh, I think she's, they've been alienated or something. But it was so sad that she said, that's my son. And but to have a mother and her son, you know, parted like that. And, by that time, I'd fall in love with her. She was such a darling woman, you know, and I, all the pathos came through. As I say, it's a, a very heady experience to be thrown with people like that, you know. And uh, to me, this sort of uh, heritage, you can see it in people like that. I know that Carolyn and all their children have an incredible uh, facility for singing, dancing. Uh, it's, it's a natural sort of thing that comes from, the, from their background. They have a confidence in themselves that is, is done through years of, of uh, having a background of that sort. Mm -hmm. I do believe that, that uh, you can have that kind of a background and you may be born in a slum and have those genes in your body somewhere and that's why you suddenly see somebody coming out of a a very, very uh, dismal black background shine. But if you looked at their history, you'd find that the father or the mother somewhere had an incredibly good heritage. Because those genes have to come from somewhere. I don't mean you have to be born. A, and it's, it's very nice to be born into that sort of thing. I think we're, we're sort of simplifying the genes. You know, we're, we're, we're not... I think that you have to, to reach the, the top somewhere in your life. I don't have to, not to be a king or a queen, but we don't have achievement now. Everybody has to be in the same common denominator, which I think is a horrifying thing. Our literature has to be, our, our theater has to be to the lowest common denominator. The reason I know this, because a very horrifying experience when uh, that wonderful program for children first came out, um, Sesame Street. Sesame Street, and it was charmingly done. Very, uh, with very little money. And uh, then suddenly they were given a great grant of two million dollars from somewhere. And I have a friend who was an art director that worked for thirty-five dollars for he, he did it because he he loved Sesame Street. <clears throat> His name is Wolf. He used to help with the layouts, and he was a brilliant man. He said they do such marvelous things, very gracefully done. And they, this is just put to teach a child. They put a card up with A on it. You know, very easy to see. And suddenly, when they got all the money, they had a a psychologist, a panel of psychologists come in. And the reason I know this is because Wolf came in to me to do some work for me. And I said, Are you still working with? I said, What's happened to Sesame Street? Why do I see suddenly, because I look at it with my four-year-old grandchild at that time, I see a great big bull constrictor comes on. What's he for? And he's real. I said, he frightens me. And my grandchild <clears throat> hides her head in my, my lap. He said, those are the psychiatrists. He said, I have left Channel 13. He said, they have a panel of psychiatrists deciding that you have to, to um, wake children up. Or Shock the child. Shock the child or something into this spending fifty thousand dollars a year for psychiatrists, he left. Then my friend at Lord and, at uh, at Altman's, <coughs> Ferris McGarrity, who's one of the vice presidents of Altman, decided that he'd like to do something for Sesame Street. That it was such a good program that it's it deserved to have a front of windows, and they were. I think somebody was doing Sesame Street clothes. Huh? They must have. I guess they had a franchise by that time, of children's clothes or something. And all the characters. And all the characters. So they decided that a front of windows like that would be nice, and they went up. And they said, no, that you are too, in other words, ritzy a shop. You're too high class a shop. 
we like to project to the lowest common denominator. Well, they used to use, the, I see this program. I'm a great television watcher, and I was to watch it with both of my grandchildren. I would be horrified. You kids get over there. And, and this is a, uh, children learning this way, how to speak English properly. And I think it's horrifying that we have to go to the lowest common denominator. We pass children out of school without learning anything. If you can't have achievement, you, you, you lost everything in life. There is a, a teaching concept, I think, which, if it's carried to its proper fulfillment, is quite adequate, which is that a teacher has to go to the children, but you don't stop there. You then bring them back. You have to bring Absolutely. them up to a level of Absolutely. some kind of achievement. Yeah. But achievement is a word. I don't care what you start with. I think out the, the Sesame Street with their little cards, and what annoyed me too was they used to have, then they had 50 more people on the thing. They had, it was, I think a child got, my grandchildren, my, especially my little granddaughter, got more confused. She didn't watch just Sesame Street anymore because there was an overburden of characters. It interwoven, there was a postmistress, and they had women's lib come in with a, you know, a great big bang. And uh, what annoyed me most was they have characters doing an A and a B. And it, it wasn't nearly as, as simple as just putting a white card with an A on it. What was wrong with that? It didn't cost anything, and they learn faster that way. Mm -hmm. You don't learn with a man making an A out of himself or a B out of himself. It's ridiculous. But this is, uh, you know, if a couple of psychiatrists and some supposed intellectual gets in and decides what children should know, yeah. well, you're a, you know, that that particular game. I mean, you should realize, you know, what goes on. Absolutely, Miss Maxwell, you did mention uh, Carolyn, and I think for the record, um, what was your reaction to her marriage? Well, I think it'll go. It's hard. It's very hard to say with with. Uh, she's rather spoiled, and I think he is too by uh, the ladies. Uh, it just depends, I think, on time. You have to let something like that work itself out. I do hope, only for my own and her parents' sake, that she doesn't have any children before she uh, decides that she can't stand the marriage. Mm. And uh, she's a charming girl, very, very intelligent, and it may be that her intelligence will keep the marriage together. But uh, I have my doubts about the young man. I'm, I really uh, would like to think that he's would be a, a father figure since he's almost, he's not as old as Renye, but he's 37 years old and she's 24, 22, that if he's the proper father figure and doesn't make, and makes her, he's old enough to make her feel her, and she is an intelligent girl. But I worry because she said, I don't know, I never can seem to please Philip. He always thinks I'm so stupid. Well. That doesn't sound very good to me, because a man of his age should make her feel uh, grown up and, and help her to uh, be more of a woman mm -hmm. and not make her feel inferior. I think he thinks he's doing, you know, going to put her in her place or something because she's a princess. That's not going to work. And she's a very intelligent girl. I've heard her come up with some, I wish I could remember them. I wish I had a, a, a shorthand machine where she's come up with some brilliant little and when she was at, at uh, I think what was sad was that they sent her to the Sorbonne too early. She came out of a convent in, and in uh, England to the Sorbonne in Paris. And this is an educational point, too. You cannot put a little girl in the early 70s when the great liberal, you know, students were rampaging around for their rights and goodness knows and put a little princess in their midst. She turned into a dirty little girl. I mean, she wouldn't wear decent clothes. She wanted to be like her peers, which were all, you know, she was just as brilliant as most of them, more brilliant than a lot of them. But she conformed again to the lowest common denominator, which I hate. I mean, why? They, they tore her down to their level. And she couldn't, she, she had nothing to sustain her. 
And I think it was the wrong choice. It has nothing to do with, with the Sawbone. I think she had to be much older to go back to it. She should have done some postgraduate work at the Sawbone and gone to a medium, uh, you know, where there were a mixture of girls of very liberal tendencies. And, yeah. and uh, her father was a very liberal man, despite being a... He's got very liberal tendencies. He runs his principality. They all adore him. And he has no problems. They're, they're, more spoiled. they're the most spoiled people on, on earth. They don't pay any taxes. They have the beautiful sunshine. They have houses built for them. And uh, they have ashlems, they call them. A-S-L-M-S. -S. They're called ashlems over there, which are, are housing developments. And he builds them. And they, he built them a beautiful new harbor with a sandy beach and a beautiful park. All for, for the populace. Yep. They live a beautiful life there. It's, they're surrounded by communists, you know. Beaulieu is communistic. Monton is not yet. Uh, Cap d'Ai is. And Beausoleil are all, have all communist mayors. And he still survives, you know. It's, it's interesting to watch that. I don't know what's going to happen now. I feel sorry for Renya because he's a great, great person. I like him very, very much. Well, the, the 50s then closed pretty much with many innovations from you, both in the use of fabric and, of course, in the resulting designs. And then came the 60s. And by 1960, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your clothes were in about 700 stores. Just about. You know. uh, in the United States. But 10 years later, you were down to about 200 stores. What happened? No, it wasn't that. Uh, I had about... Um, I sold the big stores like Lord and Taylor's and Robinson's on the coast and uh, Marshall Field, uh, Frederick Nelson. I sold a lot of good big department stores across the country. But that's why I guess I'm so much against promotion. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the promotion of the miniskirt came in and the very young, young, young look came in. Mm -hmm. Well, I, was, I never figured my clothes were either young or old. I just hewed right down the line and they were closed to fit the figure of any age from 24, and I must say not a 13-year-old, yeah. but from 24 to, to 90, my clothes should look well on anybody. But suddenly, uh, a mini skirt, you know, above the knees, to me it was atrocious anyway, because only, as I think I described before, only a girl who really knew how to wear them looked well in them. She had to have long stalk-like legs, be young-looking even if she was 40, cut her hair short, and wear little flat shoes. But the rest of them didn't do that. They wore beehive hairdos and spiked heels and uh, bosomy dresses. They were supposed to be little, simple, <coughs> short dresses with no fit, you know. So Lord and Taylor dropped me, or they put me in the woman's department, which I resented, kept buying my clothes. And gradually the department stores fell away. And they were Business went from, say, $200,000 at Marshall Fields to $60,000. And <coughs> Grace asked me to bring a collection over to her in 63. I think it's 63. And I thought, well, I can't carry coals to Newcastle if I do remember in the World's Fair in Brussels that one of our very good designers for she made popular price evening clothes, and she unfortunately brought them over, and they were shown in the same place that the French clothes were shown. And I remember her shabby beaded dresses that the beads were falling off by the, the string, you know. <coughs> Nobody knew the price of things, you see. And right after, these exquisite French dresses would be sold, and I thought, you know, why did she bring those over, you know, to, to uh, England? I mean, to uh, Brussels. So when Grace asked me to bring a collection over for one of her pet projects, the Red Cross, to do for an evening show and for a matinee or a lunch, I thought, what will I do? It cost a fortune to do it in the first place, you know. I mean, well, Pan Am was very nice. I think they gave me a place for myself and two models. And, uh, but they had very good models. I knew the newspaper fashion head of Nice Matin, and I speak French very well, so... She had a daughter who was a model, so it worked out very well. And this Monsieur Ray, who was head of everything there, just did everything for us. He even invited um, 
Eugenia Shepard and uh, uh, Ferris McGarity as guests, which was very nice of them, put them up in the hotels around so that we could get uh, uh, publicity on it. But I thought, what? I can't bring Coles to Newcastle. Well, the French do Coles superbly well. You might do them differently than ours. But after all, I'm bringing the same fabrics most of the time. I mean, they weren't that new. So I went out about before the collection. I went out to Santa Fe and to Arizona and studied our American Indian. And I did, I think it's the best collection I've ever done. Because I was out there for at twice, I went out to six week periods or three week periods and back. I had to come back and forth, but I went out and bought, I think I described the beautiful Navajo blankets that I found in white places, you know, dirty some of them. I had to have them dry cleaned. And I found uh, beadwork I had done by some of the Indians and to give them work to my idea. And I went to, Mr. New has a, was the head of a, an Indian school for boys. And I had the boys design, you know, patterns for me. And I still have one. And it's a very beautiful, he, he called it Thunder and Lightning. It's very, very pretty. Some of my favorite colors, brown, black, beige, and white. Beautiful pattern. And I paid the school and gave him a, a prize for doing the, the pattern. And I bought that East, and I thought, well, I'll do the whole collection and then bring it over. It was a fall collection. And she, when I have a fall collection, it's in April, so I was supposed to come over in May, so timing was perfect. And I said, I, you know, they, I don't know, but they must like cowboys and Indians. So I decided to do a collection on cowboys and Indians. And it was, I think, as I said, I had more fun doing it. I had more inspiration doing it than anything I'd done for many, many years. And I went to the, the uh, Hogans and saw what the women were wearing. And a lot of them were wearing suede, real suede short pants with dresses over them. You never see them walking around with just short pants on, what they call those ghastly Toreador pants. I loathe that look. But these were short, tight little pants around the knees, and they had a dress over them slashed at both sides. You know, either it was a tunic slashed at both sides or a fitted dress. Some of them had little fitted dresses. You see a lot of what's left over from Mexican and Spanish embroidery. They also use bits and pieces of everything, put it on something. I also did the uh, territorials there when our soldiers, which were handsome, and I did a pair of boots. Somebody saw them at the Metropolitan I didn't know they were at the Metropolitan Museum. I thought I only had my own pair, but evidently I gave them. I made them myself. I made a pair of jersey pants, and I copied them for my grandson, who was just born, I think, from his Dr. Denton's, which had a plastic foot in them, and you washed them. And I got very beautiful uh, Jasco jersey, and they had a zipper up. They pulled on. You didn't even have to have a zipper on them. But they had a little zipper at the ankle, so you, they'd be tight around the ankle. And I got a pair of, we were wearing those little folded shoes. You may remember them that you got in a plastic bag. And I got a pair of those. I took the uh, leather tops off. And with, we have some heavy irons that we use. They're flat irons that you use for your, in your uh, cutting room. And I took those, and I got some very heavy paste or glue. We were beginning to have that wonderful glue, you know, the Elmer's glue. Yeah. And we pasted the sole on the bottom of the, the um, uh, jersey. And I put an insole in the jersey, Dr. Scholl's little wool insole jersey with a leather foot, and put that inside to have comfort while you were walking. And it had a little heel on, and they were showing in silver buttons all the way up the side, like a, a Spanish don, you know. And a, there I did the mini thing. Everything had pants and the mini skirt, or a mini length, just below the knee, or just above the knee, which I love because it's marvelous as pants. Oh. And I did Mr. and uh, Mrs. Uh, um, Davy Crockett and Mrs. Daniel Boone in long, looked like, gra later on they were called Grandma Moses dresses, but I did them with these long calico dresses with ruffled bottoms and puffed sleeves. Just, uh, I even did a dance hall girl in red velvet with black braid, and the whole thing was there. And I did it purposely. I, I don't usually do that much of a of a theatrical 
uh, show, but I was really doing it with Grace in mind. And uh, the one I liked best was we called it uh, a Deer Hunter. It was the one with the, the legs of uh, with the silver buttons on the side, and little silver buttons down the front. And I found a beautiful hat in uh, a museum, actually, and they sold it to me because they had three or four of them. And it has real silver, etched silver, and uh, turquoise little buttons around the side and tied with a string. But it's a heavenly hat. The only trouble is, every time a girl puts it on, she will not put it over her eyes the way she should shield the sun. They always stick it on the back of their heads. I don't know why girls do this. <laughs> they want to show their faces, I suppose. But it has to be worn over the eyebrows, practically, tilted. And it's very chic when you do it that way. But uh, I really had a wonderful time doing that collection. I don't know how many. I had 64 pieces, all Indian. I had Indian beadwork on the back. I didn't want to use leather fringe. I didn't have the, the imitation leather at the time. I mean the, uh, the ultra suede at the time. But I thought it was rather chicer to take tweed and make uh, fringes out of the tweed. And I had that the tweed all the way down on a little brown and white uh, tweed suit with a lot of beadwork on the shoulder and the back. And I had uh, lots of braid trim things. That they used a lot of braid from the Spanish. You know, They had their work boxes or whatever. They would cut up old dresses and patch it on. And I had a lot of fun doing it. But my problem was I, I, I fell flat on my face with the collection. Nobody bought it. I lost another 50% of my customers, I think, that particular season. It was worth it to me because I had a lot of fun and I got more publicity in France and I got more publicity out of that show because of going to, and also the, even here before I brought it abroad, I got, I have pages and pages of very original, you know, Indian collection that Beryl Maxwell has done, but no department store bought it or a specialty shop, a few specialty shops. They kept me in business. Maybe. 300 specialty shops bought the Indian collections, you know, different parts of the Indian collection. What was the reaction in Monte Carlo? Oh, they, well, they love cowboy. Now they're even more cowboy and Indian conscious. The biggest uh, reruns of films are all uh, Gunsmoke. I don't know how many series of Gunsmokes I've seen abroad at the palace. You know, they're always showing Gunsmoke. It's fun to listen to it in French, too. Yeah. But... Uh, it was a marvelous collection to do, and I dug out all these beautiful old fabrics and blankets. And uh, the Indian, our Indian museum, has two of the most beautiful of the blankets, and they were delighted to get them because evidently they're, they're not uh, easy to find. No. Certainly, in 15 years later, they're unattainable now. I they're all wearing like a cannon towels. They're all wearing the uh, whatever. Awful looking pale blue blankets. I mean, that you see these Indian sheets or whatever they are with these ghastly looking uh, pink and blue blankets around their shoulders. But um, even while you were struggling through the 60s, you kept your company going. Yeah, but I lost two seasons. I lost. Uh, it wasn't until 67, probably, that I really. I always had, and that's why I adore my small mom and papa stores. They really kept me going. I didn't make any money, and I, I have a wonderful group of people working for me. They would rather work for me, and they all, they none of them got any bonuses, but they knew they weren't going to get any bonuses, and some, some of them took cuts in salaries until we got over the worst of it. And I said, I'll stay in business as long as you'll stay with me. And uh, the only other alternative I had was to stay out of business for a year and then go into a dress business. What was that all about? You, you mentioned... Uh, Unless the unions don't let you, you know, you have <clears throat> to, to get rid of your, your um, union. I had, as I said, 18 people or 25 people, union help. And see, they eat into your profits unless you can give them, feed them with, you have to give them, what, 38 weeks of work. Mm -hmm. So if you don't give it to them, I think you have to find a way. And, and it's, it's very expensive, believe also, the overhead of a factory. I pay forty some odd thousand dollars for, a, and most of it is, you know, forty percent of it is the factory. Yeah. Well, that overhead goes on if you're not using them. But you went to the union, didn't you? Oh yes, I, I did. I I think we did go over that in the last thing. No. 
Not on the, no, not on tape. You have told me about that, though. No, for that, for Separately. sure. They, no, they, they really um, make you give up your business for a year before you can give your factory up. They, the reason Herbert Sondheim, Conmel, Jablo, I had that year, because all code, it was, it, it was a disastrous year for 7th Avenue. Plus, all those places have been filled up by little places from abroad now. You can look at my building and every, where they only had Carmel, now they have five people. Mm. Three of them are from, two of them are from France and one is from Italy. And filling up just little cubby holes. But Carmel had a factory, oh, we all had factories there. It was a factory building. It's, it's built for factory work, so you can put heavy machinery in it and have big, enormous uh, uh, elevators in the back. But they all went out of business. Carmel Brothers, Jablo, Herbert Sondheim, uh, David Goodman, Goodstein. I don't know how many went out. Petula, uh, Joe Coppa was a good designer. Petula had to go out of business. I counted in the, that year that I struggled. Five people folded up in my business because of the unions. They couldn't get rid of the unions, so they had to fold. They all meant to go back in the business, but you can't. You, Lose your impetus, and it cost you another. Uh, now it costs a hundred to two hundred fifty thousand to to go into a business and be safe. Mm -hmm. Well, I started at fifty thousand. Then you'd have to start small. But the unions do have a stranglehold on you. There's no question about it. And I don't know whether it's a good thing. I think they're owned a lot of times by the mafia too. I think we're in. You know, when I see President Carter. One of the people that put a lot of money in his campaign is one of our biggest. Uh, it's, it's been in the newspapers, it's been in all the newspapers. Why we can't dig him up, why we can't get at the core of the, the people that are pushing drugs to those people. Why can't we do this? It's nothing to do with designing, but it certainly has something to do with, with working in a city like this. Mm -hmm. It's horrifying. I'm so small that they don't, you know, I mind my own business and they don't bother me. If I was a big shot, I'd, I'd they'd have me cook, line, and sinker. When, when you went to the union, well, you were trying to cut your staff, weren't you? Cut back a little bit? Yeah, well, I had, a, I had a factory down, because down below to save money because I had to have more space. My business was getting very, very large in the 50s, and I had to have more space. And... Uh, I took a factory down the street, but then you have to have good foremen, and I couldn't rush down there. And then in the 60s, I couldn't keep that factory going. That was only maybe $50,000 a year extra with all the machines and everything else, and you had to have two good men watching, you know, and your uh, quality control is very difficult. Mm. It's much easier when it's right. I can go in the back today and watch my people and see what they do and watch what comes out of the factory myself. But that's why I like it small. That's why I've never gotten any larger. First, this, that's first the, the one paramount reason is the bigger you get, you want to be bigger and bigger. Especially if you have somebody running your business for you, they always want to, you know, cover the earth. <laughs> and uh, there aren't that many good workers, so the, your your product is going to be inferior. There's no question about it. Unless you you, you can have what Leglon had and have a very honest, you can do it. But it, it, there are so few and far between, really. I think Calvin Klein's is, is I don't mind saying it, because my daughter-in-law, my niece, went in to buy a Calvin Klein, and my little grandchild, they all try to get in Calvin Klein's uh, pants. You know, he's this great, doing this great thing. You can have Calvin Klein in your hip pocket or something. And they're disastrous. They fit no one. I don't know how many people have gone in. And they're badly made, they're badly cut, because you cannot find people to control your merchandise when you get that big. Somebody else has to do it that's not quite as interested. I don't care how interested he is in what's coming out. He might see one or two pair, but he can't see the volume that goes out. And they're all handled by more contractors and more contractors because he's so big, oh my God, 10,000 uh, every place you look, you see Calvin Klein's uh, label or Anne Klein. And I don't think that it's good business, frankly. A name doesn't always mean, and unfortunately, they fall for a name. Even Gucci shoes cannot be made. He's got factories in Florence and all over. 
but you cannot find that many good shoe manufacturers unless they are machine made. And he, he's known for making a handmade shoe. There aren't that many handmade uh, men making, or women making handmade shoes anymore. But he's got, I've been in Detroit, I've been in Chicago, I've been in Florida, I've been in California, I've been in London, I've been in Edinburgh, all with Gucci shops selling thousands and thousands of shoes. How can he make a handmade shoe? It's not. It's sad, but uh, why be tragic. big? It really is tragic. It is tragic because you cannot train that many people to make a handmade shoe. If you're selling it as a handmade shoe, people, they don't say it's handmade, but it's just say sandia, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it, People believe that it's handmade, mm -hmm. because it started off that way. It's a beautiful handmade shoe. Quite rightly, he was popular. He made a beautiful shoe, very classic, very good looking. But I think he, he oversold himself. As uh, Valentina, is it, is it Valentina? Is it? No, Ferragamo. Ferragamo shoes I bought when they were handmade shoes, and I still have two pair of even hand embroidered gold heels on the shoe. And I bought them, and I knew years ago, in 1939, 1940, a Ferragamo shoe was handmade. It felt like a glove. And I kept using until I realized they were falling apart. And I never use a Ferragamo. Valentino makes a good shoe still. It's a handmade shoe. It's expensive. But he's not all over the place. He has one place in New York, and one place in Paris, and one place in four shops. Now, he still can control his, his shoe. But if he gets bigger, it will do the same thing. He'll go the same way. Yeah. I hope he doesn't, because that's where I buy my shoes now, and they <laughs> are beautiful shoes. They fit the way Ferragamo's did years ago. They're like gloves on your foot, and they're worth a hundred dollars. I, I buy, uh, Lamson's four ninety five shoe. I go from one extreme to the other. But I do with my food. I eat in a little uh, coffee shop, and I've gone with Grace and have a cup of coffee and a muffin or something in a little coffee shop and eat at Grand Wee, or we don't eat there, but uh, in a very good restaurant, you know, the next day. But I love that uh, wonderful contrast in life. And I like them. The, the more contrast, the better. I have sold at least 50 pairs of Lamson's little elasticized shoes. If, no, they're not. They're Woolworths. They're not Lamson's. They're Woolworths. They come in five different colors. They're wonderful shoes for pants. And this is Avery Fisher, who is probably one of our very good citizens and has certainly could buy her uh, Valentino shoes anytime she likes. Is addicted to my little uh, uh, slip-on elastic uh, shoe. I wanted to sell it, but I can't. I'd love to the people that make it are very honest. They're made in this country. That's what I like. They're not made in Shanghai or or Czechoslovakia, they're all made in the U.S. with United States labor. And it's a very, very tough elasticized fabric that looks, it's a, it's a nylon, you wash them. And with a little heel, I always put an added heel on because I like just that little, it's about an inch heel by the time I get through with it. And you can throw them in a bag and they're, I, would, I wear them mostly with pants because they're a wonderful pants shoe. I have a navy blue, beige, black, they even come in gold and silver, which I don't, I don't, I, I do wear a higher <laughs> heel at night. But uh, I have a friend who loves low heels, and uh, she, she wears the silver ones with her little silver pants all the time. I mean. But I, I really feel that that kind of contrast is, is fun, you know. I, I do my home that way, as I showed you my pictures, you know, I have Woolworth pictures on my wall. It's, very wonderful Flemish painting right in the middle of it. <laughs> of course, probably, I don't remember how much, but I got it at the Sotheby Galleries, and it was one of my very extravagant gestures to myself as I fell in love with it. That was probably when I was doing my medieval collection that I fell for that medieval lady there. It's a Flemish, very not very well known Flemish artist, but it's, it's a good Flemish school. And my beautiful, um, they call them verglas on, on those paintings on glass of uh, Charles II and Montrose. Right. Yeah. 
Interesting. But they're mixed right up with my little Woolworth paintings of 1927 or 8. <laughs> they're still on my wall. And well, the painting by Renier is rather nice and fun. He, yes, painted, yeah. he painted Grace and myself and her sister when we were all three here before we went to the greenhouse at Neiman Marcus. And he painted us as three fat ladies with mink coats going into a little greenhouse and coming out thin angels. And I love he, he is a good artist in this one. He complained that my paints were dry, otherwise he would have done a much better job. So I love it. He signed it. That's great. Well, getting back to the sixties, you, you did go to the union when you tried to cut back. Yeah. Uh, well, the they stuff. let me uh, what was their what was their attitude towards what you were trying well, to do? Well, they don't care really. You know, I said, you know, I said, look, do you want to do this? I still had they were maybe I would have used uh, instead of thirty workers, I would have used more than fifteen. And I said, Well why otherwise the only alternative I have is to throwing everybody out of work. Now I have fifty six people in Toto working for me, and they'll all lose their jobs. They're not all union, mm -hmm. but at least if you let me get it down to 18, I'll at least have 18 people that will be working that otherwise will be out of jobs. And I said, do you think that's uh, right? And I said, after all, I've been in this business for a long while. Couldn't you at least have some humanity? From even a human, oh, we don't run our business that way. We don't run the union that way. We can't think of humanitarian methods in the Union, said one great. And I don't think the that council, of coat and suit council, does you any good at all either. They play in cahoots with the Union, I think. And if you're big, you see, you can give them a couple of thousand dollars to do what you want, but I'm not about to do that anyway, and I wouldn't have that much money, and I'm not that big. But uh, I finally... Uh, sold them on the idea that I could reduce my, and give up the factory. And mm. I said, I, it's very hard for me. I was trying to get rid of the, all unions, you know, the, all of the people, because they do have jobs. You know, a lot of those men were working as foremen in big factories today. They all go out to long, they don't, a lot of them don't like to live in, in uh, Philadelphia or move their families. Yeah. So, but a lot of them can get jobs. Most of them can get jobs if they want them as uh, directors with very good salaries, you know, even more and steady jobs as directors of, of merchandise and watching, you know, foremen really, mm -hmm. glorified foremen because they know how a garment should look and be made. So they can find jobs. Most of them are, I must say, out of town, you know. Mm -hmm. Newark has, now Newark is dead, I mean, but then Newark did have some clothing manufacturers. No. Philadelphia still has. But uh, I very luckily they I talked them into. Uh, I really had to practically, you know, go into closing my business up before they agreed. Well, but you did indeed make it through the sixties. Just uh, barely. Just, just barely. barely. But I spent all of my heritage. My lawyer and my accountant said, "Mrs. Maxwell, you know, you have no money in the bank." You have barely enough, you know, to pay your bills for the next season. You've got to give it up. And I said, no, I'll do it another season. And that season sort of turned the, I must have prayed nicely. <laughs> but that season did turn the, the thing, and I got a lot more shops in. And I, they were beginning to go back to un outre things. You know, they, you know, we'd gone through all the, I think the highlight, really, was Lou, Rudy Gernreich. I was trying to, I may have mentioned him before. Oh. A Rudy Gernreich, talk about getting to the bottom of the, or the top or the bottom, whichever way you want to look at it. But he came out, you may remember, that he came out with shaved heads and tattooed bodies, as that's the in The epitome. The epitome of fashion today. Oh. And I thought, that's the end. I said, and he's Austrian. I have the same heritage as I have. And I even resented it more, I think, because that's the other side of Austria. I'm the more gemütlich side, I think, my family. But uh, I really felt that that was, you know, the end. That was the pit, as far as I was concerned, of fashion. And it, was, it went from there, to, and it still does. There's still a lot of the Rudy, Rudy Gernrock, and also Mary Quan and her buy a dress and throw it away. 
even if the hems aren't done, it doesn't matter. Even if it has a raw bottom. I mean, just, you know, you should have a new dress every week. I know this is the most idiotic thing. What, what about the time you take to buy a dress? You know, it, it, it's, it's really, it's sheer stupidity. And, uh, you know, I just uh, carried on my own little business as, as always, making very simple clothes, beautiful fabrics, and, of course, very good workmanship. And people were beginning again after these tawdry dresses that were being spewed out, especially the Mary Quant kind, that the hemlines were drippy. And uh, we still, you know, there's, there's a fetish still for that. Mm -hmm. But they love to have, you know, it's sort of a banner that you don't care. But there's a point of marvelous nonchalance that doesn't have to be tacky. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can tell a woman who looks absolutely divine. And you're not quite sure why. She has a lovely nonchalant air about her clothes. They're never too stylized. And there's nothing worse than the French woman that just comes out of a hairdresser and everything is, she's so spick and span, she drives you off the wall. You know, that's another cup of tea, too. I dislike that as much as I dislike Rudy Gernreich's bald head. I mean, there must be, well, I guess maybe I'm um, right back with the Greeks and the, the median way, you know, it does, it doesn't have to be boring. I think it's a much harder job to balance yourself properly or balance anything in life properly than to... Uh, and to keep afloat in it. Than to keep afloat in it. Right. Much more difficult. And not be trite and not say the same thing over again, but to have an even balance of... of uh, I know one great architect said he was building his house. Johnson, I guess, Philip, Philip Johnson. Johnson. I may have mentioned that, that he's uh, Italian blotted out, but I was impressed. And he said he was going to build a house that had to have everything in it that he wanted, but not would be outdated because it was so modern, and not be as old-fashioned as some uh, 18th century colonial house or uh, Christopher Wren. Mm. And his house is, it has a classicism that I like. Uh, classicism is a hard word because when you think of the classics, you think of Greek columns. Yeah. It doesn't mean that really. It means holding. In literature, you can read books, and if you read them the third time, as I've just been doing with some of uh, Samuel Johnson's work that I, you know, read maybe 20 years ago, just read it again. It, it, it comes alive. I didn't know what I was reading 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It is the most interesting thing to read now, what that man said is astonishing. That's what I call a classic. That's oh. what I like to think about my clothes. If you dig it out of a closet 20 years from now, you should be able to wear it in some way. You should never have it that long or that short that uh, it should be outdated. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be freaky in it, you can always cut it off to your navel if you like. <laughs> you can still do something with it. That's wonderful. In 19... <laughs> I'll blot out my laughter, but that, that's, that's <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> Okay, in 1970, um, you did make quite a return, as a matter of fact. The Smithsonian honored you with a retrospective of your work. and That was, uh, a tr that was probably, for me, that at least was, uh, I'm going to shout my name, but for me that was really uh, the thing that made me go on, because I thought if the Smithsonian thought enough to give me a one-man retrospect of my clothes from 35, it was the first time I ever showed my 35s to uh -huh. 69, 70, whenever it was, 71, I think. 71. Uh, it was such a, a boost for my morale that it kept me going. Mm -hmm. And I guess, it, well, that's a, it was a turning point was a little before about people beginning to like my clothes yeah. from a financial point of view, but from a point of view of morale, that was one of the best things that ever happened. When did you bring Ultra Suede in? Wasn't that in the that period? No, that 71. Period? Yeah. 71. Yeah. And yeah, you, right you bought that the Ultra really, uh, how did that really... How did you get started with that? What was well, there, uh, Nancy White had a swatch in her hand coming back from Paris, and... Uh, I said, gee, that looks like Gazelda, most beautiful fabric. And she said, it isn't. I said, it comes in small pieces, doesn't it? She said, no, it's a polyester fabric, or poly, 
it's a poly fabric of some kind. I don't really, even today, I don't know quite. I know it's made with oil. That's why it's so expensive now. But uh, she said, oh, you can't have it because they'll only send it, sell it to the French couture. And I was a little angry about that because I thought, uh, we have as much right to a fabric as anybody. And uh, certainly Pauline Fichier or Norman Norell then, I think it's still alive. And I called my little man up in Japan because I'd been dealing with him since 19, certainly 1940, or before the war, I guess, 1939. And I still buy silk from him. I called him on the phone and asked him if he'd ever heard of Torre, and he said, yes, they're making new fabric. And I said, it's exactly what I'm calling you about. And I said, could you use your influence to sell them me? Because he, he knew my reputation mm -hmm. better than anyone. So about three weeks later, three little Japanese walked into the showroom with visiting cards and great bows and charming. One of them spoke English, a little brokenly. But he vowed that I could buy some. But I had to buy about 40,000 yards. And we bought 11 colors, I think. It was about 11. We have about 22 colors now. Mm. We started with 11 colors, 40. Well, by the time I got a piece of each, you know, and it was only it was about $14 a yard then. It's, it's, uh, but even so, $40,000 sort of swayed on my shelf. And I put it online. I had it with velvet. I, I put it with jersey and velvet because I felt that it was a nicer fabric to use for skirts. I still think it's a better fabric for skirts and jackets and coats than it is for a dress. And uh, of course, I didn't but sell But when you introduced it, 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 it did not sell, did it? Not at all. I had 40,000 yards of fabric on my shelf. and Nobody bought it. And then Halston got the fabric just one season later, I think. And he sold it to poor buyers, you know, the, the ones who buy his uh, couture clothes. And I think the buyers, like uh, Claire Perrone, for instance, in Detroit, who knew Charlotte and bought clothes in her shop, uh, she, smart woman, Claire Perrone, and saw it on Charlotte Ford and then knew that I, she'd seen it and passed it up with me. Yeah. But she quickly came back and bought mine, and then she's a good one on there. A lot of others saw it around and remembered that I had it because it was hard to get, you see. And of course, I had an influx of people because they knew they'd I'd had it first. Did Halston and, buy his from Japan as well? Oh, yes. He, no, he didn't. He bought hers from Spring Maid. Spring Maid, ha I had it from Japan the first season, and then Spring Maid took the franchise over because I bought mine from Torre directly. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, six months later, I had to buy it through Spring Maid. We had made, and Abe Waters, who's the big guy at Spring Maid, knows damn well that I, he's, we have a very good picture in it if we ever want any amount we want, we get it, you know. I think Halston certainly uses more than I do because he's got a much larger clientele than I have. But uh, I sell a tidy amount of it. And it hasn't sloughed off at all. I mean, it does in the summer, this time of the year. It, it you know, naturally breaks down a little bit, but we'll be selling it again. We still have a wrapped skirt that I, and the coat dress. There's never, you know, we would have 20 of them hanging there, and somebody's bound to call up, and we don't cut ahead many. Cut maybe, <coughs> if a shop calls in for 15, we may cut 50, mm -hmm. because we know that uh, if something's starting to sell like that, then other, but we don't cut much ahead at all. But the suede wrap skirt, and we have blouse to match it, dyed in the same fabric, goes out like, you know, it comes in and out, which is very nice. I mean, we get fairly good cuttings on that. Have you done your, have you done the flight suit in suede, or in ultra suede? Uh, no, I think I did that in wool for the was last collection, wool, yeah. yeah. With a, that you pull the skirt off right. and you have the little pants underneath. Yeah. That I do with jersey pants and a jersey blouse for flight wear and a mm. big coat that you can wear anywhere, you know. Yeah. And I did that 1949 or 50. For the first time, but then the you first did it time, again. And then I, I did that. I copied my little one, my little um, shoe button coat last year too that sold quite well. Mm -hmm. A big sleeve, luminous coat that I did in the uh, what we call uh, chiffon camel fits, lovely lightweight camel. Warren of Staffordshire makes it. 
<coughs> they're at our house I've worked with for years and years and years. Are most of your lines, each year you do tend to go back and pick up something at least, don't you? I have lately, years. so you make a line to line copy of Beryl Maxwell's. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind no. Of fun, you know. <laughs> no, but I mean, no, obviously, I, I, I think going back a little bit, but I don't like to, you know, go back. I did that for fun because mm -hmm. I mean, showed, we did last year just for fun, we showed four things that I did uh, in collections and did. A modern version of them. They're all changed a little mm -hmm. bit. Collars and sleeves are slightly changed because we don't put gussets in sleeves anymore in 1949, but a triangular gusset is other ways to, to cut it now and cut a sleeve. Yeah. Well, then the obviously the, the business is, is back. As it were, after a well, bit of a hiatus. You never, on Seventh Avenue, you never know. Each season yeah. is a new season. You can't say this is it. You know, what? you can be fall flat on your face. You know, next April. I hope I don't, but I mean, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if you. You know, you're after all. You're. Uh, it's a creation. It's 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 a creative effort, and. Uh, you never can tell whether your fabric's going to be right or whether your customers are going to like it or this is my, I don't know, they didn't like suede. I thought it was, I was thin like Flynn with a beautiful sh suede and nobody bought them. So you never can tell on Seventh Avenue, which is exciting. It's like, it's why it is very much like theater, you know. Timing, timing is terribly timing. important. I've been so wrong on timing. My Indian collection was badly timed if I'd waited for a year and a half, I would have gotten right in on the swing, you mm -hmm. know, and people would have understood it. Many things I've done that have been very badly timed. The suede was badly timed, you know. It's a funny thing. Fashion is very much like the like the publishing business or like the theater. Uh, you know, you can have an author that you swear is going to be the best book that's ever written, and he has a dud. It's not his fault, really. He just didn't make it. You know. The um, historically, with you, uh, as well as with most American designers, um, it was interesting this morning. For another purpose, I, I went through uh, Eleanor Lambert's world of fashion, and especially the the uh, Hall of Fame section. I was just trying to set chronologically um, the working years of, of designers to see how they matched up, etc. And, and in so doing, read a little bit of the biographies that are given in that particular book. Historically, most designers have had an uphill battle in this country. I mean, oh, uh, very few of them have made it to a position of, of uh, Yeah, I think of all the young things that are, that are coming out of schools, you know, like yours and, and Parsons mm -hmm. as well. And so few make the grade, but that's true of the theater too, and, uh, and writing in most right. careers. Um, but that's what makes it exciting when you do make it, you know, mm -hmm. it really means something. Recently, I, go ahead. No, I do think that uh, in looking at young people coming out, I grew up like Topsy, so it's, it's not a fair thing, because I never, I did, go to a school and took a six-week course on pattern making just be, but after I arrived almost as a designer mm -hmm. but I used to work with pattern makers a lot you see when you're in a small business like that when you're in these big businesses now you just have a designing room you don't know what you know you have a, maybe make up a few samples but you don't have a big cutting table you don't have these expert uh, cutters and head cutters and I learned so much from them. Mm -hmm. they used to even let me use the machines and the intricacies of cutting. Fortunately, this is a separate thing. You don't have to learn that. That's why I think sometimes in schools, all schools do that. They predicate too much on things. I think you go out and buy a Vogue pattern, for he heaven's sakes. You don't have to learn how to cut a pattern out. You're original. You cut an original one. You don't, you know, you don't have somebody teach you how to cut a pattern out. You learn something from osmosis or from seeing things around you. But this, I've seen more girls struggle away, and I've had girls working for me, and they've been sitting in the back trying to learn how to make a pattern. I just took a brief course, so I'd be more, a little more knowledgeable about it. I didn't learn anymore, really, from that, because my cutters, 
you know, they cut with calipers, and I don't, you know, I give them the ideas that I want, and I cut something out of it. I always cut it out of my fabric, you know. I want to see how it drapes. I don't want a piece of paper. What can you learn by a piece of paper? That's why I gave those girls fabric. I think you have to learn from fabric and cut something out. Even though I don't drape an awful lot, you still have to put it on the, see what the fabric's going to do, how it's laying on the, on the figure, you know, on the, on the mannequin or one of the figures. Uh, another thing, when they come out of school, they should go to, evidently, St. Louis has a lot of children's uh, manufacturers. They shouldn't stay in New York. I think they should, we're blossoming out in the theater in Idaho and Iowa, the little theater movements. I think they should go to small communities and start, you know. There's a group of girls I just met when I was out in Chicago. A very smart girl has taken 10 young designers out of, a, out of a, all the different schools there. And she even got one of them from New York, I think. Her parents just moved out there. She's got them all designing for her, and she takes their ideas and puts them into things, you know, and uh, they get paid by whatever gets put on the, her line. At the end of the year, she has, uh, the reason I know this is because I was looking at some clothes at a big fashion show I went to, and a charming little dress came out, and it had, for me, to see anything that looks rather new and rather attractive. It was a simple little black dress. It had something about it, and I said to this, uh, actually, I was with the now ex-mayor of Hollywood, uh, of uh, Chicago. Chicago's wife, and she said, oh, I'll find out who designed that, because they didn't say it. It was just a girl walked past a model, and I got a letter from, uh, i forgotten what it's name. I just wrote and thanked them. The head of this place wrote and said, oh, we're very flattered that you liked one of our dresses. And she told me about hiring. I'm a, her name is Lieberman. And uh, it's called Fashion Something. But she puts a collection out of about 150 dresses. And she has these 10 or 15 girls that uh, submit uh, samples, you know, submit sketches to her. Mm -hmm. And she, she works with them. And they uh, bring in their fabric that they want to make it out of, and they get the fabric for the young woman, and they make them up. They have a studio to make them up. But it seemed a very good idea to take a bunch of young girls like that, or young girls and young men, and give them a chance to do that. Doesn't have, I don't know of any place in New York that does that. Some of the big... It might provide an answer to something that I wanted to ask you about um, that happened. Last fall, Madame Gray made one of her rare appearances, rare appearances, excuse me, in the United States. She was in New York for a showing of her collection to benefit the Musicians I Fund. I saw that collection. Yeah. It's magnificent. Wasn't it incredible? It was at the Hotel Pierre. Right. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, during those few days when she was here, we had the opportunity to interview her. It was done by one of our faculty at FIT. And um, she made, the, she was asked if, what was her opinion of American fashion, did she think there? Does she think that there is an American fashion? And um, she said that she does not feel there is such a thing as American fashion. That there is only a French couture, and that all countries receive their fashion inspiration from that. She went on to say, however, that by taking from the French. The American manufacturer is much more capable at adapting, uh, at adaptation than the French, than the French are. Oh. But she she did say that there is no such thing as American fashion. How do you react to that statement? Oh, very, very, especially knowing Norrell as I know. Norrell was so completely American, and he was I must say he was trained abroad, but he was only trained in the workmanship of clothes and. Um, but his style was so completely simple. I think only Chanel, and he was different than Chanel. I don't care what you say. I could tell a Chanel from a, a, a Norel any day. And I think that we've done much more in, in uh, sport.
sports. We're sports minded. We started in sports wear. Most of our designers, like myself, started doing ski clothes, riding habits, tennis dresses. Um, we're sports minded. Mm -hmm. You have White Stag. I had to give, you know, my bosses had to give up the, the sportswear business because White Stag and Davika came in and, and, and I'm afraid did a very bad job. But Tennis Lady is, uh, bought one of my tennis dresses just two year, you know, two seasons ago. And uh, I did an ultra suede uh, skirt with little pants attached in the top. And she liked it enough to buy it. And I liked it because I hadn't sewn so many tennis dresses for a long while. Yeah. And it was in New York, you know, it was rather fun to do. But I don't, I have to say that there's, a, there's an American way of dressing. We were the casual people, of, even more casual than the English, and they certainly were casual, but a little more meticulous than we are. Mm -hmm. I think we're a little more gay, nonchalant, and, and uh, laissez-faire about our clothes. And the comfort of our clothes, I mean, the French were all, so constricted. Just recently, I was at, it wasn't four years ago, to speak of the difference between American design and French, Madame um, Agnelli was visiting Grace, and a more beautiful woman I've never seen, and we're around the swimming pool, and she has a little place where you put your bathing suit on, and we went in to change our clothes, and I was, Mrs. Agnelli and I came out of the pool about the same time. Grace had gone in, to check on lunch, I guess, and uh, left uh, Madame Agnelli and myself. And I jumped out of my suit, and I had a little one-piece linen dress on with a boat neck with a great big um, compass in the front that I had designed. It, again, one of those things that was too early. It didn't sell for some reason, but it had a little cap sleeve and pockets on the side. And, and I put a pair of pants on, and it was lined, and it was very heavy linen, but very loose. And I dried myself off, took a shower, combed my hair back. I must admit that I was luckier than she was where wearing my hair. I just combed it back, put my barrette on, and I was putting a little makeup on, and, and uh, here she was, turning around to me. She'd been hours, you know, for, for her hair. And I was there, waiting for her, and she said, how did you get dressed so fast? I love that dress you have on. And she would do, what? Look at this. I have 96 hooks and eyes. And she had a dress on, some beautiful cotton. It was a work of art, really. But it wasn't today. I mean, it had hooks across the back and up the back and down the side. T beautifully done. I was impressed from the point of view of workmanship. But it wasn't today. I mean, you don't dress that way. But that was the, and she said, where can I get your clothes? And I, she'd never bought anything of mine, and she ever will. But here she had this dress on. It had hooks from the, all the way down the back, and then from the back to the side, it folded over beautifully, all little hooks and eyes, and down the side. There must have been, I didn't count them, there must have been about 42 hooks and eyes on that dress. Beautifully done. Beautifully done. Mm -hmm. Lovely neckline. It was a bit overdone for a little lunch. Yeah. Grace was dressed the way I was, a little cotton dress, you know, little cotton shirt dress, and her lovely sandals that she wore in Mogambo, which I love. She wears them all the time and she polishes them and she, so she's had them sold once. And she said she, they're, they're sentimental, you know. Mm -hmm. She did that picture with Clark Gable. I don't blame her for being sentimental about the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I always envy her having, he was in love with somebody else at the time, but I mean, she said just to, to he was like a father to her. He was treating her just like a little daughter, you know, mm -hmm. he said, but he was so darling. She, Daughter. Where do you think, or, or what do you what do you feel is is a, the sense of fashion today? Well, I because my dress, I guess from a point of view of Mrs. Agnelli, and my dress, it must have seemed terribly, un, although she liked it, mm -hmm. from the point of view of Mrs. Agnelli's beautifully constructed dress, and I always you know lined inside and tucks and all handmade. It was a work of art. But I ha it had no relative bearing on, on the way we were. And this was only about five years ago. <coughs> no definite bearing on what we wear now. Mm -hmm. and it was more than that. It was about 10 years ago, I guess. But there, that she must have, anybody else would have thought of mine as a terribly unconstructed dress. I had a little zipper up the back. 
and I just pulled it on, zipped it up the back, and and uh, you couldn't see through it. I had a pair of a, a panty girdle on, a bare, naturally bare legs, so I wanted to get them brown, and a pair of very simple little slippers. I always bought Dr. Scholl's and my summer shoes and winter shoes. <coughs> winter for warmth and summer, as I like bare feet, but I hate to have my foot on plastic or leather. So I buy, buy Dr. Scholl's pure lambs will insole. It's a wonderful fashion point to wear in the winter, in the summer, because the tennis players wear woolen socks, mm -hmm. because otherwise they, it's abrasive, cotton is abrasive. Yeah. But <coughs> I slipped on my little flat shoes and was off, and I must say she was very sweet, and she was laughing. But I think what you're saying is that maybe my feeling about the sloppiness of clothes today is like Mrs. Agnelli's dress and mine. The clothes are a little too sloppy for my way of thinking. <coughs> so do you, do I hear you saying that the fashion is killing itself by? Well, I you know I think maybe the amount of people, maybe the great production houses on. The, I I have a feeling that that uh, it's is rather sad. The department stores are going to go out of business because of the J.C. Penneys, who are very much better merchandisers today than the department stores. Nothing wrong with the department stores. They're in real estate business. They're buying places all over, and they may make money on real estate, but I doubt whether very much whether women will have the patience to go from one department uh, one department to another to look for a blouse and. And you look for a skirt somewhere else, and you look for something somewhere else, and you waste your whole day. Women have too much to do today to waste their time in department stores. That's why the J.C. Penney thing, which are all over, but the merchandise is clean, it's mass produced, it's not. You either do that or you go to a small specialty shop. And I think that's why the rise to me of the service stores, which I call the small specialty store, where a woman is still wanting to look. Uh, a little better dress than a J.C. Penney dress. I, in my inimitable taste in using Woolworth's shoes and uh, Valentino's shoes, I buy things in Sears Roebuck, sweaters sometimes, shoes, uh, certainly uh, stockings, and uh, I'm a very, very hard on pantyhose. So I buy my pantyhose in places like that because I'm not that meticulous. I have a few pair that I want to look absolutely elegant when I show my legs. But if I wear pants, I don't, you know, I often wear those little half socks today. Mm -hmm. But I'll buy those in the mass-produced stores, like the J.C. Penney's and Sears Robo. They're the coming thing. But I think there are big name department stores, despite all their production of the big names, are going to fall apart. Because they cannot give the service. And they cannot give the individual thing. That, otherwise, women, why not go to some little place where you can get uh, mass-produced things? Well, mass produce. Do you think that's that's the sense of fashion for the future then? Um, well, and they these they're very funny about their you know they catch on very quickly to fashion. I've seen children's things like they had a oh I don't know cowboy look for children you know the shirts were cowboy and the, the western look for children uh, was all over the children's market to the down to the cheapest the lowest common denominator. Some of them very well made by the by the same token. Uh, I think you either go and have handmade children's clothes made by some, or you buy them. You, there's nothing. I think we make the most wonderful mass-produced children's clothes in the world today. I wish we could show Russia our mass-produced clothes. They have eye openers, I think. But I think that destroys fashion in a way, because you know you. I think the only person who really does anything today is to make something individually for a woman, which doesn't exist. It's too costly. She has to pay a thousand dollars for a dress, and then it's hard to get a <clears throat> dress thirty dollars a yard, and she wants five yards of fabric. And the, who do you? I have two women that have given up. They used to make clothes for a couturier. One worked for Balenciaga. She's working for me because. You know, Balenciaga is out, but when she came to this country, she worked, was making clothes by hand, you know, or for the individual woman. But her life was miserable. She hardly made any money. She'd have to charge anywhere from $500 to $1,000 for a dress. 
the wretched, I don't say this, but it's very sad, spoiled women were the only women who can afford that sort of thing. She And I met her through altering some of my clothes when I couldn't bother to take them down, and she did beautiful handwork, and it was cheaper than my girls who were factory workers. And I would take it over to Marcel, and she'd do a hem for me, or very often finish off something. And I got to know her very well. And friends of mine used to use her, and I got to know her. And she was in tears one morning. I came in on a Monday, and she said, I stayed up all on Saturday night getting a dress finished for somebody this morning, and she's off to Europe, forgot all about it. And she said, I stayed up and hired somebody to finish this dress for this lady. She said, it happens time after time. They're so spoiled, these women, she said. And I have to charge so much, and they don't want to pay. I have to charge $500 for a dress, and I sit up, and I pay two other little workers to help me do all this handwork. And she said, they leave me. And uh, she said, and then what irritates me more than anything else, they pay $1,000 for a Dior and bring it to me, and I have to reconstruct it because they, they're, bad, they're not badly made. They're beautifully made, but they don't fit. And she says, I have to take them all apart. I don't get paid for taking them apart. And I, I said, would you like to work for me? And she didn't realize the salary I could give her. And she's marvelous in my sample room. She said, two of them I have, Jacqueline and Marcel. They both worked for Balenciaga, and they're marvelous working for me. But they'd much rather work for me at a steady salary sure. than go home nights at 4.30 in the afternoon and come at 8.30 in the morning and have an hour for their lunch and make $300 a week. They didn't, they didn't make $300 a week, even charging $500. Uh, by the time they got the fabric and they'd have to order more fabric and the fabric would be wasted, you cannot, it, it's terribly hard to be a couture in this country. Mm -hmm. I could see by these, these women, even if you have a name and, and, and are a good couture, they had, they, people knew that they were from Balenciaga. But Bergdorf has given up their couture department. Henri Bendel has given up their couture department. It's impossible to keep going. Mrs. Avery Fisher had her daughter's wedding dress first done. $4,000 for a wedding dress, and she had to cancel it because they couldn't get the fabric then, and there were all sorts of things. But And Bergdorf made most of the money, not the little people that were making the dress. They weren't getting paid. This woman came in, and they wanted to make a slip. It was $300 to do a little white slip. That's where I came in, and I was up there with her. I love her daughter. It's adorable. Well, they canceled the whole thing, and I don't know. She had another dress made somewhere else. But the slip was $400 to do, a, you know, a piece of material with two shoulder straps they wanted $400 for. Now, I think that's, you know, there's something wrong there. And they're not, you know, there are too many spoiled women like that that, that will have things made, you know. Uh, they have them made abroad, and some of them are lucky. But I don't blame them. They're over. I don't blame the couture, the French couture, half them. They've all gone into the pet a porte. Most of them are boutiques. The all boutique does much more business than their couture. Even the French woman doesn't want to sit around waiting, and then it doesn't fit her, and then she's going off somewhere else, and she doesn't need the dress or something. Uh -huh. The boutique uh, idea is much better, which is just our ready to made, ready made, which we've been doing for hundreds of years. <laughs> Or a hundred years. Mm -hmm. How about your own future? Com the future of your own company? Oh, listen, it's uh, my age. I don't think of the future anymore. Just It may go on as a Brooks Brothers because I have beautiful help. They're charming people. And the girl who's worked with me, I, you know, Nancy White is interested in Sally Kirkland. If I hope they do because I'd love to keep my staff mm -hmm. going. It is almost a Brooks Brothers business now because my buyers is, you know, I have buyers call me and say, do you have any little dresses around? You know, they know that I'm not going to send them anything that won't sell, that I, that I, or they'll say, can you make up some skirts for me, sight unseen, you know, and I, I, it's a skirt that I've made. I mean, it's not something they don't know about. But they're sure that I won't shortchange them, and they're sure that it'll be well made and uh, made as quickly as possible. From a point of view of, 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 um, you know, 
wholesale clothes or ready-to-wear clothes. I'm the last that can turn out a, some girl getting a going away suit or something for her wedding. I can cut it in my factory and get it out the next night for her, within reason. I mean, it's the fabrics in the house, the color she wants is in the house. We do that for small specialty shops. That's why I don't like big department stores anymore, because I love catering to a very good specialty shop, but she does, you know, maybe $50,000. I don't have many accounts doing more than, but I have enough doing fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. Just breaking up to a couple of seasons doesn't amount to much, you no. see. It's very, it's almost like couture business because that woman in her little town is getting a very specially made dress. It's not uh, a Calvin or an Anne Klein that you can get from coast to coast at any department store. And I don't think made as well as mine because mine is made in my own factory. I watch everything that goes out. If I don't watch it, Jerry Brady watches it, Joe Lieberman watches it, the salesman that sold it watches it. There's always somebody around. Oh. The, 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 the girl that ships them, Irene, who's been with me for 24 years, watches it. She was my uh, button girl, trimming girl. She came with me when she was, what, 18 years old as a button girl and a trimming girl. And when my uh, Cyril, my head shipping clerk, left, I asked if she'd like to try it. And she, yes, and she hired, I said, now if you need somebody, you hire them, you know. So she hired a young black boy to help her, and they, the three, three of them run my shipping department. And everybody knows Irene, you know, she's a wonderful gal. Mm -hmm. I have Joe Lieberman, who's been working for me for 20 years, uh, David Leibowitz, who's been working with me for 25, Jerry Brady, who's been working with me for 25 years, my bookkeeper has been with me 15, uh, Mr. Mursky, who takes care of my factory, had a factory of his own in Yonkers, and uh, he's 84, and he came back to work about 10 years ago, and he loves it. His, his son is one of the most eminent doctors in, in Mount Sinai, Dr. Stanley Mursky is very well known. He's so proud of his sons, and oh, he is such a darling guy. And he doesn't speak the King's English, and I wish they wouldn't. I'm glad that he's old enough now not to have to speak English the way his son, I'm sure, would like him, or mm. not his son, his daughter-in-law would like him to mm. speak English. I love his idiosyncrasies. He used to call Cyril Cereal, <laughs> which I loved. You know, we all used to call him Cereal. And he's such an adorable. He's a, a heart of gold and a brilliant man. I love him dearly. And I keep calling his son because I said, are you sure it's all right for you? She said, he says, keep him working. It's keeping him healthy. And I think of my own life too. I, I wouldn't want to give up my work, keeping me young, not aging me. Yeah. But uh, if, if you could, at this point, look back over your career, are there any changes that you would like to make? The only thing, perhaps, since my clothes are just as the Gucci shoes are too expensive now because they're badly made, I don't think I get enough recognition. I've never won a Neiman. I never won the Hall of Fame thing. I've been designing long enough, goodness knows. I console myself because Bob Hope has never won the the, uh, yeah, the Oscar. The Oscar. <laughs> so I, I hope I'm in a class with Bob Hope, not as funny or as good a comedian, but I hope as good a designer as he is a comedian. But uh, my clothes are not expensive enough. When uh, Pauline Trigea came and she said, oh, she's only going to make very expensive clothes. They're the only kind that sell. I had Louis Adler wanted to come back and work to me, work for me. And he wanted, we had a great big promotion in mind. And maybe I was wrong there that my clothes should have been, I don't know why. I don't personally think they should be more expensive. My clothes I know are as well made as anybody in this market, with the exception maybe Adolfo's $1,000 suit. Or Zuckerman's who suits sold when he last sold them about five or six hundred dollars. He may have put more tailoring in them. I could put more tailoring in them, but I I found out myself that a hand lined suit doesn't go through the dry cleaners as well as a machine lined suit. And I saw that myself. And I'm very logical. And I think, well, you know, I send a ha I used to make handmade. I send my own handmade suit to be. And the dry cleaners are, play havoc with your clothes. And I'd come back, and the whole lining would be handmade lining. 
first, because now maybe Adolfo's lining to put in with this eighth of a knot, one sixteenth of an inch stitch or whatever. And the more you, your workers work and the harder it is to get them to make such as that small. But even when they're made small, the hand work when dry cleaned a few times pulls apart. Mm. So I purposely put machine lined in my coats and suits, which kept them being less expensive than, a, than more expensive, because I felt they were better. I think in nylon lining, we have proved time and again, we have silk linings come back to us that have to be relined. If you line them with nylon, they last forever. So why have pure silk when you, if you get the handle of a nylon? Now, I know that there are nylons that are not worth their salt, but there are nylons made in Switzerland that feel like silk. Or in, in uh, I have some silk chiffons that are polyesters made in Japan that you cannot even pull it through a wedding ring, a yard through a wedding ring, which is the good sign of a good piece of, used to be the good sign of a beautiful piece of silk, that you could pull a yard through a wedding ring. Hmm. I can do this with a piece of uh, fabric. Now, I had this a year before Halston, this particular chiffon. I noticed that in one of his fashion blurbs that he was talking about this beautiful chiffon he just discovered <coughs> from uh, Japan. First time he's used polyester in an evening dress. And I, I, about two years ago, I found it. I, buy, I see a lot of this. I have a wonderful Japanese connection. <laughs> Very good one. But you, so you think that <coughs> it, it would have been helpful to you? It may have Maybe. been helpful to you to. to but it would have been probably for my reputation. But what, whether I would feel as significantly right about my clothes as I do. And I know that I am putting out an exceptionally good suit for t today $200 or 200 a quarter that otherwise would be $500 from, from somebody that has more of a name than I have. When I say name, in quotes, hmm. like Gucci. <coughs> I know they're better made than, than uh, the Kleins. I know that they're better made, and, and now theirs are more expensive than mine, but mine are intrinsically better made. And I like this. I like the feeling that my clothes are made in a small factory. At a, they're expensive to some people. To pay the cheapest dress I can make now in a good piece of fabric is $69. It sells for 150 But it is well made. Mm -hmm. And my ultra suede's are lined, you know, and they're beautifully cut, and the linings, the inseams are all very well narrowed, you know, you, I cut them off to and turn them back. And I've seen a, one of our good designers in the Hall of Fame, I, his coats were not right next to mine, suede. Not Jeffrey Beans, because mm -hmm. he's a good, he makes very good clothes, they're much more expensive than mine. But this was another designer, and I picked one up. It had strings inside the coat. It was only $10 cheaper than mine, but it was so atrociously made. You know, the, some of the hems, were, some of the linings, not the linings, some of the inside seams would come from maybe a quarter of an inch to a half an inch back to a quarter of an inch with all the strings hanging off them. Around the sleeve, they'd be, they didn't tie them off and cut them. I've seen on men, they, when you finish a... Uh, a seam, you take the two strands, double knot them by hand, and then clip them. You have a nice, you know, finish. Yeah, they just pull them out of the machine and throw them on. They're all made by contractors. You could, they don't care how a thing is made. No lining in the sleeve. Badly pulled in the seams around the sleeves. But when, I don't. That's the only trouble I find. I don't think there are. There are fortunately enough en enough women for me that like my clothes. And know me after, you know, 40 years of designing, there are a lot of daughters now, granddaughters that are wearing my clothes mm -hmm. and like them. But, uh, and they know good clothes. And I like to sell women who are knowledgeable and want good clothes, not the, the ones that are looking for a great bargain on one hand or for a name on another. I don't think half the women buy my clothes for Vera Maxwell names as buy my clothes because it's a good value, which I like. 
So fortunately for your customers, your intent is to keep going. Well, I'll keep going as long as I can, yeah. Which is great. As long as I can. Miss Maxwell, in, in closing what for me has been a most enjoyable experience, um, in closing this interview session, you have indeed been alive and certainly been working in the fashion business about 50 years. Um, and this year you've celebrated your 75th birthday. Looking back over that amount of time, if, if it is possible to pick the people that had the greatest influence on you, who would you select well, for that list? It is rather difficult to pour 75 years of an active life into a shorter space. But so many people did give impetus to my life. My grandmother I've mentioned so often, that just goes without saying. And an Aunt Elsa, who was a maiden aunt, who took her two nieces to operas, and my first treat at the theater was Daddy Longlegs, and also to very, very good restaurants. So we had a little touch of what the outside world was like. And she certainly gave me that. But by the time I got to Seventh Avenue, Ethel Smith of Abercrombie and Fitch, president, uh, vice president of Abercrombie, and before that, Lord and Taylor's great merchandise woman, as Mary Lewis at Best and Company, both gave me an enormous amount of direction. And Ethel Smith, Smith particularly, uh, was a very personal friend. She did so much. She had a son a little bit younger than mine, but on a personal basis, she befriended me and took me by the hand of Louis Adler and got me my first job there as a real designer. Before that, I was just a sketchy little designer working really for people that didn't know I was a designer. And, uh, well, I don't know, Mary Lewis, as I've mentioned. Dorothy Shaver has to be mentioned because she was one of the great women in the... Uh, I, all those women never needed li women's lib, really, but Mary Lewis was incredible. I mean, uh, Dorothy Shaver was an incredible woman with her little lace handkerchief. But Louis Adler has to be mentioned. I mean, I've, he was such a bad, a hard taskmaster, but I learned a lot from him. And you do from people that, you know, lay the iron rod on you. And uh, I must say that I learned a lot from him. And on a personal basis, so there's a little girl that I have to mention. She was Louise Dexheimer, only from a point of view of what valiance is and courage. She was left when she was, maybe that was the sympathy, she was left as a very young girl at 16 with a baby to support. Her grandmother again helped her. But I have never, she's now her son is in the Navy and uh, she worked as a waitress, she worked, she worked for me, she worked for people in the neighborhood and I have never, she just visited me today, and I've never known anybody with such perseverance and such honor and such integrity as this little waif that was born on a farm. I mean, she's, she really gave my life uh, a meaning when I watched that child, uh, when she was a child. And on a personal, real person, really personal basis, my brother, who is also a professor at uh, SUNY at Harper College, gave me the, my greatest delight today and gave me a taste for classic literature, especially the 18th and 19th century. I don't think I could live without that today. This is one thing I can lose myself into biographies or history or just any part of the 18th and 19th century. I must thank him for that. And my grandchildren, they gave me a whole new aspect of life, teaching them, teaching them swimming, painting. Uh, they're my great companion and adorable children, very close to me, needless to say. I think the extended family is very important, by the way, and I think grandmothers can teach more than, not because mothers can teach, but because they have more patience with their grandchildren than mothers have. And my daughter-in-law, who produced the children, I must give a vote of thanks to, and last but not least at all, my son, who is a great, great friend and a great critic, Dr. Maxwell. Well, Ms. Maxwell, I, I certainly, um, on behalf of all the students and researchers and when people they... who are interested in the history of, of the industry, and certainly who will be interested in your life, I, 
I certainly want to thank you for these several hours of interviewing. I know it has not been easy with your schedule, uh, as busy as it is, but I can assure you it's, it was well worth the time. Well, it's fun being interviewed, uh, John, by someone like you, I must say. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.